So if you could just send the link. And um, I'm broadcasting now. Hi, a very good evening to everyone that's joined us today. Uh, on behalf of Team ISF, um, I welcome you all to day 12 of India's largest virtual science festival. India Science Month Online is a month long celebration of science and technology. Uh, this is a public engagement platform that aims to bring together scientists, researchers, educators, students, teachers, and all science enthusiasts to one platform in order for everybody to collaborate together and make science more accessible to society. We have a bunch of events that we have planned for all of you across the entire month of January. And the best part about this festival is that everything is free to attend. All you have to do is log into our website, check out our events, and uh, we have a Zoom link for all of our events, which is absolutely free to access. So all you need is an internet connection and all our events will be available to you. We have many, many workshops for uh, young children from three, three years old and uh, ranging from workshops on uh, DIY uh, uh, science experiments to coding to uh, workshops on uh, research writing for uh, budding researchers. This um, festival aims to make science access accessible to everybody and we have something to do for everyone. And we also have a lot of fun games at our um, festival. So we have drawing competitions, science jams, pictionary, model making, and so on. So make sure you head over to our website and check out all games that you could participate in. We have some very, very exciting prizes for all our attendees. Um, we, are, we are also providing certificates uh, for our sessions. So in case uh, you haven't told your friends and family already, now's the time. Uh, these are the last few days of our festival. Uh, the festival ends on 31st January. So make sure to make the most of it while you can. We have very exciting social media competitions going on. So if you head over to Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, you will find all our updates and you can uh, participate in our Twitter challenge. You can just tell us what you like best about our, ses about our sessions and we will bring the best tweet to everybody's attention and the best tweets get exciting prizes. So make sure to participate in all our competitions. We also have, um, a, we have a very uh, interesting lineup of talks today. So I'm just gonna quickly tell you what we have lined up. We have one talk on combining artificial intelligence with art. We have one talk about how science can be communicated through tribal songs and folk art. We have one talk on uh, how, how it is to travel to other planets and living and working in space. And we also have one talk, a very interesting one, on the interplay of space science and science fiction. We're going to talk about aliens, extraterrestrial organisms, and more. So make sure that you stay put till the very end of uh, today's session because it's going to get exciting by every minute. Um, our festival has three international competitions which we have been, uh, which have international participants, one being Talk Your Thesis. Now, this event is um, for all MS, PhD, and postdoc researchers who have a thesis to present. We have asked, um, we had asked our audience to send us their thesis and explain it in 10 minutes. And I'm very happy to tell you all that the finalists of um, all our competitions are going to be presenting at our online festival. And it is with great honor that I get to call upon Jayashri Mazumdar from Aizer Mohali, one of our finalists for Talk Your Thesis, 
who is now going to be presenting her thesis. And let's hope that this is a great one. Jesh, if you could please turn on your video and audio. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such an honor to have you. And uh, we're really excited about your thesis. So without any further ado, let's begin. OK, uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Thank you, first of all. Yeah, so. Hello, my name is Jeshri, and I'll be talking about uh, non-human primate tool use and tool culture. So before I talk about my thesis, I'll give you a brief tour about the subject I deal in. And for that, I want you all to think, think something like how did we humans become the human today? Did we evolve with time? And what does even adaptation have to do with evolution? So basically adaptation is something which we all do on a daily life. Like right now it is winters, I'm wearing a sweater to keep myself warm. It is a kind of adaptation. Evolution on the other hand is a long-term process and you cannot see it, it's, it's totally invisible. Like coronavirus, for example, you see the number of deaths due to coronavirus alone in a country was significantly less than the number of deaths which happened from, uh, uh, from people who were suffering from other diseases. So what do I mean with that and how do is that related with evolution? You see for evolution, the entire population faces a similar problem, but everyone at an individual basis have different set of defense mechanism and only the fittest of it survive. And the one which survive undergoes further evolution. It changes itself and modifies to best fit in the particular surrounding it is kept. Similarly, we humans also have adapted and evolved a lot from an ape-like creature to the human form took us millions of years. And it is not just that, with us, the tools also have undergone a lot of modification. My particular study is actually trying to understand how different factors is influencing the evolution of primate tool use and tool culture. But you must be wondering, if I'm so much interested in tools and tool technology, why do I study non-human primates? So just take yourself back millions, millions, and millions of years back. Then you see there, there is a point where we as humans and the non-human primates had a common ancestor. From there, we all divided further. But it is just not this. If you see the behavior of this particular species, like the non-human primate species, just like us, they have social hierarchy. You can call the caste system in India. They also have higher, middle, and the lower caste, and they have specific rules which they have to follow within their caste. So you see, behaviorally, as well as taxonomically, they are very much alike. So uh, studying them actually helps us to understand how we as human might have evolved. But why did I choose this particular species? This is the long-tailed macaque. And interestingly, this is the five specific species which are proficient tool makers and tool users. But don't take me wrong. I do not mean that the rest of the primates do not make tools just because people have not observed or it has not recorded. Uh, sorry, sorry for the interruption. Yeah. Just because uh, uh, like people have not observed or they have not recorded other species making or using tool, it does not mean that they do not make tools. But what has, you know, prior studying different primate species have, uh, have actually revealed yet? Now take the chimpanzees from Africa, you take the capuchins from South America, and you take the long-tailed macaques from Thailand, not from India. You see these three particular species from three different geographical regions, they all have shown to use stone tools for pounding activity. What is interesting over here is this, that these three species have shown the similar type of tool making abilities even when they are taxonomically apart. But if you see the long tail macaque in Thailand and in India, they use different set of tools as well as tool technology. This is interesting because why same species is not using the same technology but different species from different geographies using the similar technology. My basically my topic is actually trying to understand how this global clustering of tools and tool technology is happening. But another interesting feature about my study is that the region where I study, I study in three Nicobar Islands. We don't know how this long tail macaques might have landed up in this particular island. But what we know is that these particular islands are geographically isolated from the mainland. Also, these are restricted islands, which means no other human beings apart from the islanders are allowed to stay in this particular island. So with so many forks in my hand, I want to understand how the demography, the ecology, as well as the hierarchies affecting tool use and tool culture. 
So I've been talking a lot about tools and tool culture, but what is this tool anyway? You see, any object with physical and functional changes becomes a tool. Now, let me give you an example. Take a pen, and I use this pen to tie my hair in its position, right? It becomes a hairpin. It's no more writing tool. So I, I, may, I may change the function of this particular pen. But I take the same pen, and I dismantle the parts, and I use this hollow part of the pen to drink water from a glass. It becomes a straw. You see, I change the morphology as well as the function of this particular object. Similarly, my macaques in my particular study area, they also pick up the things which is lying close at hand and they alter it. They alter it in a way which helps them to ease their process. So you see, what I want to understand is that how this unpretentious activity of making simple bone, stone and wood tools in the past would have given rise to the complex machineries we have today in the present. But what type of data do I collect? This is the main question. Well, you see, I study the macaques and I study the behavior. So it's basically behavior data collection and it requires a lot of patience and some bit of luck because behaviors as tool use is very rare. But before you go to the field and jump over there and start data collection, habituation is the most important process. What you do over here is that you make yourself familiar with the animal so that the animal does not get frightened and your presence is not having any effect on this particular species. Additionally, in this particular time frame of habituation, you also try to identify who is whom in the particular group. Once you know this, sampling is very easy. For me, I use focal animal sampling. So what is this focal animal sampling anyway? You see, I have already created a kind of habituation with you. You know me, I know you. So my habituation process with you is over. But now I'll start with my sampling. So for my sampling, I, I see one of my subjects from the entire audience. And then I record whatever he or she does in a time frame of 15 minutes. Now the catch over here is this, that if my subject is doing something related to tool use or tool manufacture, my sampling will stop only when the objective is performed or complete by the animal or when he or she discards it. So after that, I scan again the entire population to search my second subject. I find my individual and I redo the entire process. This is how I collect data. I basically observe simple behaviors like what are they eating, whom are they fighting with, whom they love, whom they hate, using simple behaviors like grooming, sitting in contact. And I also take out the details like which type of raw material is used to make the tool and how the tool is even manufactured. So what did my study reveal till now? You see, my study has revealed that this long-term macaque used eight different types of tools in six different behavior contexts. Now, why is this very important? If you see the literature, they will say most of the tools in the past is related to foraging behavior, which is food related behavior. But my study is actually talking about the other behaviors, which is also equally important to understand the evolution of tools and tool technology. I'll show you a video. This is Mune. He's a low ranked man, male, and he's using a scraping tool in his right hand and the food he wants to consume is in his left hand. He scrapes the surface of the food before consuming it. Hence, it is a scraping tool. Then what I have also seen is that males are proficient tool users than the females. Now, why is the sex bias happening? You see in a group which composed of both males and females, females after becoming adult, they retain in the same group they are born. But for the males, they leave the natal group and join a new group. So you see with new incoming males, the behaviors get diluted because they need to adapt. And in order to adapt, they need to learn as well as teach each other new behaviors, new, new technology. And as I have told before, adaptation is a very key feature of evolution. Then another interesting thing is that the long-term macaques in India do not use stone tools, whereas those in Thailand do use stone tools. Now, why is this happening? Let's look at the ecology. See the island, uh, the macaques, which is in this particular island, which is on your right hand side, they have a lot of stones as well as oysters, but compare it to the Nicobar Islands, it's more beach like, which has more of sand and less of oysters. So what do the macaques do? The answer is very simple, they adapt. So the macaques in these particular islands, they adapt their diet to become more of insectivores, frugivores or folivores. And hence you do not see stone tool making ability or they do not use stones for pounding activity, which the macaques in Thailand do. The very interesting fact of my study is that the macaques in my study area, they share food. Let's take a look. 
these are two groups the fp group had shared termites with and it was shared by the high rank males but in bq group the coconut was shared by the low rank males now sharing could take place due to different factors but this is the first study which has actually uh, actually act uh, depicted sharing of food among the wild animals uh we still don't know how this and what factors are actually influencing this differences in who is sharing and what food is being shared this is still under investigation and my study till now has very surely re reported that these macaques do use stone tools and sex and ecology is having a very strong influence on how tool, tools and tool technology is evolving but this social hierarchy part is still something i am investigating but before you leave the seat i want you all to think how we as humans became the human today and next time you come across a monkey through the street or anywhere you visit i want you all to think what is going behind the curious brain of the macaque with this note i would like to end my talk and i would like to thank india science festival for giving me this platform and all the people involved who have helped me during my phd as well as in this presentation preparation and the funding bodies which has so graciously funded my research and you as an audience who have been so willful to listen to me thank you Any thank question? you so much uh, jayshri that was really very interesting i mean i i do understand why you made it till the finals for this competition that was such a very very um, you know thought provoking project and um, i i really hope that uh, it it has inspired a lot of our listeners to get into more research like this it is very interesting i'm sorry um, for the interruption which happened in between like the java thing just popped up and so the presentation just stopped in between i'm sorry about that no worries you were so good don't worry about it at all i think it went off wonderfully and uh, with that i'm going to ask you to please switch off your video because we'll be moving on to our next session thank you so much jayshri uh, well that was a very very interesting uh, talk to listen to we are very excited for the next session now but before we begin with it i'm going to launch a quick poll for all of you to answer because we want to get to know a little more about our attendees so if you could please answer the polls that i am launching for you on your screens right now um are you able to see the results on your screen uh, like like we can see uh, maximum audience is college students followed by a few school students some faculty members some professionals in tech and uh, in life sciences and medicine and we have some from uh, entrepreneur and business so uh, that that sounds like a very interesting mix and uh, now i'm just going to request you to answer the second poll that i have for you all to get to know a little more Okay, so the results on my screen tell me that most of our audience members don't know much about this topic, but are curious to know more. Some of them have read a little about it somewhere and wish to hear more about it. And a very few percentage of um, our attendees have studied this topic and wish to pursue it further. So it looks like again a very very interesting mix of uh, attendees that we have here, which only makes a talk more and more exciting. And with that, it is an absolute honor with which I welcome Mr. Sleeba Paul. Um, if you could please turn on your audio and video. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Paul. It's really lovely to have you at India Science Festival. Uh, I'm just going to give a quick introduction. Uh, 
he, uh, Mr. Paul is working as a machine learning engineer at Ericsson and has uh, been working in the field of artificial intelligence for a few years now. And he is going to be speaking to us about a very, very unique project that he co-created along with his peers. And uh, it's a very, very cool topic to think about because we are going to be talking about an AI artist on cloud. Mr. Paul, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes, yeah, we can. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, for the, uh, I'm Sliva Paul, I'm a machine learning engineer. Um, so, um, for the next maybe 20 to 30 minutes, I'll be mostly talking about one of my uh, past projects. It's named Aurea Cathy, uh, an artist in the clouds. Uh, so before starting the session, um, I would like to just acknowledge the challenging times we are having. Uh, the pandemic, uh, it's been unfortunate uh, for uh, many of us, um, like 2020 was not, uh, not at all planned as the way we wanted it. But anyway, in the challenging times, I feel that some of the, the uh, behaviors we have picked up, uh, like say spending more time with the family or um, maybe you know personal hygiene uh, everything uh, all of those positive things maybe we can imbibe uh, to our rest of our lives and um, on that positive note uh, you know uh, in the adversity in the verge of adversity also if we can if we can find something positive uh, that would be great and that's a great attitude and on that positive note i want to start my presentation um, so uh, uh, Aurea Cathy, it's a, it's a side project as uh, mentioned before. It's a side project. Uh, I have worked a uh, you know, couple of years back and let's uh, begin with the idea, how the idea was formed. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, so um, Okay, I'm sorry, I am, I am, okay, got it. Okay, so uh, that's uh, on the left side that you're seeing is Fabian Rashid and on the right side, it's me, it's Liverpool. So uh, one thing I want to uh, make sure that, okay, so I don't really have, as you see it right now, I don't have the long thick hair I, I had when I was doing it like, um, so I want to tell you something like a hair fall is real and <laughs> it's actually going to get all of you guys. <laughs> sooner or later <laughs> okay anyway so uh, fabian and i are um, uh, from the same college but we didn't interact much uh, when, we, uh, when we were at the college because he was my super senior then after that he uh, joined adobe he was working as a chief you know a kind of innovator at, the, at their innovation labs and it was uh, really amazing he actually had around uh, 70 patents to his uh, himself and uh, he's uh, doing tremendous things in um, you know um, in the field of art and uh, design i was also doing after my masters i was doing many things related to artificial intelligence and i've been doing projects and uh, we um, we started talking after he noticed one of my projects and these immediately connect each other because we both wanted to create things. Uh, he also uh, was working with art and design. He was also creating a lot of things. Same thing with me also. I was also trying to understand um, how I can um, apply machine learning techniques on different problems and like that. So immediately connected on that note and we started jamming. It's a, it's a you know, the time frame was all, um, I think 2018, um, September, October. Uh, that's when it was happening and we started jamming ideas okay build okay do let's do something like okay art and design is there that regime is there and then uh, we have the uh, ai regime let's let's mix it up and let's understand what's going to happen let's build something related to that and finally after a lot of uh, you know brainstorming sessions and ideas uh, idea jamming sessions we finally landed uh, to an idea called artificial poet artist. Uh, so it's very abstract, uh, right? It's a very abstract uh, thing. So what is artificial poet artist? That means uh, it writes a poem, 
and then based on that poem it creates an image an artwork and finally based on the mood uh, that image is colored so artificial poet artist does all these three things but it is artificial it's not it's not a real person who is doing it so that's a uh, <laughs> that means uh, it's a very abstract idea and um, the obvious question is uh, how to do it because um, i'm not sure how many of you guys are working on ai but um, this kind of an application this kind of a complex sophisticated abstract application cannot be you know done with a single algorithm that's the point here so how to do it is it was a question uh, i faced uh, during the after the idea creation so um, this next question was how how to do that okay so the approach i have taken was okay say this is a complex problem and we don't have a single answer but we can actually break this problem down to multiple components and then uh, address each of them like uh, divide and rule what <laughs> colonials was doing to us so divide and rule uh, it was it was uh, that idea uh, you know put things forward um, say like um, algorithms uh, say i can create a poem with a language model language model is something related to natural language processing and that field so um, i'm not sure if anyone of you are not familiar with it also it's you can actually uh, don't worry about it because it's not a technical uh, presentation so um, language model just think it as a black box and i am actually feeding a lot of uh, text to it and train it and once i train it i can actually generate the uh, generate similar context of uh, text so it means if i want to generate poems i can feed the algorithm the poems and then i can generate poems that's how it works it's as simple as that but it's not as simple as it is but you know on a uh, falcon view it's, it's it is what it is so i used uh, gpt2 by um, openai that's an algorithm by uh, from a research organization openai and uh, the training data i used was 3.5 lakhs of uh, haikus haikus are short points japanese short points but we used uh, the english points in the same structure and uh, it is coming from reddit and that's how we trained our language model so it it solves one problem that is generating points the next one is how to um, generate an image from it, a text uh, from the text so that is again done by another algorithm algorithm called attention gan gan means uh, generative adversarial networks it's an advanced topic in uh, machine learning but uh, uh, that's uh, that's coming from again uh, microsoft uh, research and um, that's how we transition uh, we do the transition of uh, you know uh, from the text to the to an image and again uh, after the image uh, we do the style transferring for coloring the image so style transferring must be known to you many of you guys because there was an app called prisma okay prisma was there uh, it what it does is it actually uh, create your uh, you know create van gogh uh, art 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 uh, uh, from your selfies that's what uh, that kind of things where prisma was doing i am not sure if that if that app is here right now but it's almost similar to um uh prisma style transfer and we have used a bit of advanced uh algorithm for it uh, it's called fast photo style from uh, nvidia and uh, in that what uh, what is actually special about it is we have used style images as the wiki art data set the, the wiki art data set contains around 4000 um artworks which are classified or aggregated on the basis of human emotions that means there is a happy picture there is a it's, I'm, i'm actually talking about in a, in a layman terms actually so it has a happy picture maybe maybe an angry picture maybe a, everything related to emotions so once we transfer the style and the color from this uh, artwork to the generated image which means that essentially we are actually channelizing the idea of uh transferring the emotions that's, that's not the perfect way to do it of, of course we can argue on that but uh, that's what we did actually for the project so this is the engineering framework uh, uh but maybe maybe something much simpler can be shown visually is how the data flows through the the pipeline so the first one is we generate a haiku from the language model it is haiku line means i don't say i was a huge fan of that method 
that's something generated uh, that's a generated point and then the next one is an image generated or uh, from the text so as you see it's a very abstract image and uh, some maybe you can argue that doesn't make uh, you know um, much uh, it's not much correlated to the the text we are having but that's true that's true but in at 2018 the best we had was attention gap but when when two years after in 2021 open ai coming from coming with uh, something called clips and it's a it's an amazing uh, text to image net, uh, network and it is doing amazing work on the same uh, uh, context but at that time we had uh, limitations from the technology and the algorithms limitations were there in the literature so we used the best we can and once we have the image we can color it so completely became something else okay so after styling what we get the image that's the final image we that's what we you know try to present somewhere with the point that's the idea so you understand what the idea is and how it was evolved in um, using you know the different algorithms the engineering infrastructure i hope you got it now it goes to the persona of Oria. So what kind of an artist Oria is? Okay, that's the next thing. And regarding that, uh, Oria is actually, Oria Cathy is an anagram. Uh, you must be knowing about what an anagram is. So AI haiku art, the same spelling, different words. That's what it is. Uh, so um, AI haiku art is uh, transformed to Oria Cathy and it gives a persona of a woman. Uh, a female artist, and we conceived her as a um, social media artist actually, who posts the artwork to the social media through Instagram and Twitter. And uh, it was planned as a one year project. So there will be, for every single day, there will be a posting, okay, in Instagram and Twitter. And there will be 365 artworks once the year ends. So the year was 2019, okay. And everything about Aurea is artificial. So as we see it, the points generated by the Aurea is coming from an algorithm. The image is coming from an algorithm. The styling is coming from an algorithm. And the best part is on the right side, what you see is the face of Aurea. And uh, let me tell you, uh, that's also artificial. That person doesn't exist. So it's, uh, it's looking very uh, authentic when it comes to a face of a human being. But, it's actually an artificial person. It's it doesn't exist. That way, that person doesn't exist. But uh, it is also you know coming from an algorithm called progressive gains by Nvidia. So these this is actually the the i the, the prime idea we are trying to pitch in. Like the, uh, the artist is not like the artist we see or we have seen. It's completely artificial. Face is artificial, art is artificial, the points are generating are artificial. So that's the idea we're trying to, you know, uh, the concrete idea we're trying to imply here. And, uh, but look at her, she's, she's beautiful, right? She's really beautiful. And then goes the content. So, uh, okay, I have talked a lot about um, the, the, the generation, the idea, and everything, but at the end of the day, what we are trying to understand is how good it is, how good the content created by Aurea. That's that's, that's a question. Okay, uh, she's an artificial artist. We understand it, but how good it is? Then we can go to the the point generated by one of one of two points generated by Aurea. Think about the the left top one. I knew they don't want to be the problem. They just want to be the best. Yay. So that's uh, that's something that's something very deep because think about uh, now we have a lot of uh, you know confrontation going on uh, between the government and the the farmers at Delhi. Delhi. Then it is actually uh, then we, when we are actually reading this, this, these words with the context of that kind of a revolution, they don't really want a problem. They don't really want to be the problem makers. They just want to be the best for themselves. You know that's that's a uh, very deep i'm not saying that uh, an artificial algorithm or the mathematical model can actually be philosophical no the meaning is actually made by us human beings not algorithm so when some uh, ore is making a, a poem like that it is actually seeing ones and zeros but when we see it 
we actually you know read it with the context like a you know a farmer protest that is going on in the capital we can understand that okay this makes so much sense and the other one is like uh, you really believe the government is controlling the person in washington so the borders has changed recently and <laughs> that's also you know when we mix up the context with the the artificial content generated by the artist that's uh, going to the completely new level okay then it's about points but then the next slide is kind of the one of the insanely beautiful slide i'm going to show you this is coming from Aurea's work, think about it, see, see, this is, this is amazing because in the each frame, we have an artificial artist, okay, generating some kind of a picture and it's going to a frame and think about it, how beautiful each frames are kind of a masterpiece. And think about it, in the near future, uh, someone is coming to a living room and there's actually a wall painting there and someone is asking, Okay, nice work. Uh, who did that? And you say uh, that's not done. That's not done by a human artist, but uh, uh, but software. And, and and think about it. It's 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 not um, a far future. It's it's a near, very near future. We we even have we even had the plans to do it, but anyway, it didn't happen. But that's what it is. Each one is insanely beautiful. And then comes the perfect collaboration. So we have talked a lot about uh, uh, the engineering architecture of Aurea, but uh, I said it in a very you know, peripheral view, but it is not what it is. It is actually a bit complex to maintain this pipeline, you know, uh, bringing in multiple algorithms. It, it is tough, uh, trust me on that. So then comes the perfect collaboration with the, one of the greatest companies ever found in this planet, Microsoft. Microsoft uh, came uh, through uh, uh, um, uh, someone who, is, who should be you know, mentioned here. His name is Santosh Pillai. He's the principal program manager of Microsoft or Redmond Office. He actually came in and he was very much interested in this idea. And he said, OK, we have this platform. Uh, would, would you mind uh, you know, trying this platform and understand how we can use it for Aurea? So then, then we had a, you know, it was kind of an epiphany, you know, like uh, our vision about, you know, uh, our vision about building something so abstract, but through, you know, divide and rule uh, uh, fashion and for each algorithm, there is a compartmentalization and it is, it is actually matched with an industry giant's uh, product. And that was so much validating and that's so much reassuring that the way we see things is the same way the industry giants are also seeing things. And that was amazing. And uh, not only that, we, we were able to use their platform uh, and they actually helped us, you know, building the tech stack. Also, they have uh, financially supported the project. And uh, this is actually the technical stuff. I don't really want to discuss it, but uh, it is as easy as you know doing this entire project on a single Jupyter notebook. It is as simple as that. Um, and the next one, the stage. Uh, the stage is really important for an artist. Uh, in our country right now, we are seeing a lot of oppression for the artist because they are talking against you know which is not right, and they are being you know putting into the jail and everything. So for an artist. If there is no stage, then then there doesn't mean anything to them or to the art. So we also wanted great stages for Aurea. Okay, Aurea's uh, art should be heard and seen and experienced by the human beings on a large level. We wanted that. Okay, we are posting it to the uh, Instagram and we are getting good response from there. That, that's not enough. That was simply not enough for us. So then we explored the ideas where we can portray or we, where we can showcase our work. And we found the perfect stage for that. And that's uh, Florence Finale. Florence Finale uh, that happened in 2019. Uh, Aurea's work was selected under the contemporary art. And uh, that's us, uh, Fabian and me, uh, representing Aurea and her work uh, at Florence Finale. And on the right side, what you see is uh, the 
Colosseum and we were taking our duck face selfie over there. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, so let me tell you about Rome. Uh, it is one of the greatest places I have ever been to. Great, great city, great food, great people. Uh, when I was, you know, um, studying B Tech, I think, I think that at that time, I think I'm seeing the film Angels and Demons. Okay. So Tom Hanks star, star film. Yes. So um, since then, I really had this, you know, uh, this. I don't know how to put it. I really want to visit the place. Uh, and with Aurea, that, that was kind of a bucket list that happened. And there is a lot of bucket things happen because of Aurea in the, that is in the rest of the slides. Okay, so that's what it is. It is a great experience. Everyone loved uh, the work of Aurea and the novelty of the idea of a virtual artist, you know, on an international platform. Great. And the next one is, is someone, uh, if you're working in the regime of machine learning, you will be knowing about your ideas. It's a, you know, the, the greatest um, technical conference that happens every single year on machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. And uh, Aurea's work was selected to the online gallery of near ideas as well. And uh, that's about the stage. And about the media coverage, um, you know, Aurea was loved by the media, you know, the idea, the, there was a lot of featuring uh, in, in radio, in online platforms, in, in newspapers, it, it, was, it was an amazing thing, you know, yes. Um, so, and then comes the most important part. Whenever we talk about uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning, a lot, a lot of times we get this backlash that, okay, Am I going to be get uh, you know replaced by a robot? You're going to kill my uh, job. That's what I say. That's what it says. But that's that's entirely a different topic. When it comes to create human creativity or art, we don't really want to replace anybody. We want to collaborate. We want the artificial agents to be collaborated or inspire human beings, human artists, and in, you know, instigate their creativity to, to try something new. So inspiring human creativity is the idea we are trying to put it, put it here. It's not about replacing people, or, no, it's not that. So on that direction, the things happen. That's the uh, first one is, uh, this is actually work from Aurea. Okay, this is a generated image. What Fabian did was he actually painted a, a painting, a canvas painting, with inspiration from this current uh, jet, uh, image generated by Aurea. And that's amazing. He called it the augmented artist. That is, a human artist is actually getting inspiration from the uh, virtual artist, and he's creating something new with it. That's amazing. And then again, the other one is coming from the trolls, actually. It's actually Malayalam. I'm not sure how many of you guys will be able to read it, but it's very funny. You know, I, I personally believe that I also make trolls sometimes. So um, I feel that uh, trolls are actually a great way for self-expression. And uh, it, it requires a lot of, uh, you know, skills from, uh, from relative, relative, you know, relating things together or, you know, it's a lot of, you know, creative work involves with making trolls. So I take it very seriously. So even trolls were made. And the other one is really, really on a diff very different level. Okay, it was right, it was written by uh, someone called Jay Sri. She's, uh, you know, uh, she's not uh, coming from an age group who is so much interested in artificial intelligence or something like that. She's a housemaker in Kerala. She actually heard about this, uh, this idea of building a virtual, uh, virtual artist. She was she read it through the newspaper, and then she wrote a poem about Aurea, about the idea. You know, the very idea of a virtual artist. She was inspired by that. She wrote a poem with it. These kind of things we want it to be happen when AI is coming to the art or design or whatever. It is inspiring humans to do the next next thing, the, the big next thing, big next step. Great. And uh, the next one is the talks uh, I I did uh, 
with uh, the, related to this uh, project. And the first one is a uh, uh, TEDx talk uh, from I, I, in 2019. And it was not entirely about Aurea, but it was a part of the, the, uh, the Aurea was part of the talk. And it was about the projects that I, I have done in the past, which actually based on the idea of building new perspectives with artificial intelligence, think about it. You know about the usual artist, a human form of it. When we replace, or, or when we, not replacing in that sense, when we replacing that idea with a virtuality, virtual uh, artist, uh, there will be a lot of perspective building. Okay, there will be a lot of perspective building. And when we see the world through that new pair of uh, eyes, uh, that will make very different sense. So uh, the main idea, uh, main project that goes into that talk is about building, uh, you know, uh, a new gospel with algorithms. You can check out uh, that project, uh, Gospel of LSTMs. That's a project I have done in 2018 or something. You can read about it online, but I don't want to be you know, uh, elaborated here. But it was about generating a new gospel by training the algorithm on all gospels. So it's a kind of a very new way to see things, see religion, see, you know, society, uh, everything. And the other one is, other talk is about PyData, and it was uh, PyData Delhi, I, I delivered a talk there. It was about the engineering aspects of Aurea. That's the two talks. And then, um, Anybody who would like to dig more deep, it was actually, you know, it, I was just scratching the surface, but there is a lot of course with Aurea. If you really want to know, understand the complete full picture, full scope, uh, you can actually log, log on to uh, aureacathy.com and you can understand what all things were happening around Aurea during all these years. Okay. And um, at last, uh, I always, I'm so much inspired by the, the the, the persona of uh, Steve Jobs. So always try to include something from him in every every presentation I, I deliver. In that, uh, it's one of my favorite, something like creativity is just connecting things. It's, uh, it is what it is, you know. Whenever people say, whenever people talk about innovations, they get this mistaken idea that, okay, we have to build something from the vacuum. That's not true. Nobody, nobody done that. Okay, everybody actually were inspired by the 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 older self and learned things from there, and they connected it and they built something new. So this is what innovation is about. Whenever someone is saying like, "Okay, I'm going to build something new," it doesn't mean that it's entirely new. It existed in some other form. These people just understood it, or they connected to different ideas through a single, through a unique channel, and that's how it worked. Anybody is, uh, you know, stopping you from innovation, uh, saying that you have to build something new, entirely new from it. That that's not true. That's the that's the uh, idea I want to put forward through Aurea and through the court of Steve Jobs. Okay, uh, so that's the last slide. Uh, anybody has questions? Uh, Mr. Paul, that was such an interesting talk. Thank you so much for uh, talking about the entire journey of uh, creating this artist on cloud. I think the best takeaway from for me uh, through the course of your session was how um, absolutely passionate you sounded about the entire project. I think that speaks volumes about how much you feel about this project that you invested in. And I think um, a passion goes a long way. Uh, always, and, always my baby, you know. I'm so glad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we have a couple of interesting questions. I'm going to start shooting them one by one. The first question that we have here is, what are the limitations associated with this project? So what sort of uh, limitations did you face while building this? And how? where does it stand right now? Great. So uh, uh, the first thing uh, I've already mentioned in the talk is about algorithm limitations. You can't just come up with a single network, neural network, or any kind of an algorithm to build something like a very abstract idea of a point artist. You can't just do that. But there are actually the, the research is going really well. And in just a matter of two years, the entire state of the art has, has changed completely. So now we have a very able algorithms to, uh, to do it, but still we really don't have a single algorithm to do it, but 
we have algorithms which can actually do much better than two years. Okay, so that's one thing limitation is there, and then we then we want to do something like a, you know going to the production with this kind of a, an idea. It's very expensive. So you know, that's a, that's another limitation when it comes to you know finance and everything. But luckily we had uh, Microsoft and they liked us. They actually funded the project because we lucked out. But then something else is happening. What I'm trying to tell when it comes to finance or something, believe in your idea, do it. Someone will be interested and help will come. You know, help will come. Don't don't just get uh, uh, you know. And other one is coming from the the mentality of people. So we actually try to um, present this showcase this idea uh, to a bunch of people, and it was they were like, okay, you guys are actually getting into the, the capitalism is getting into the art regime, and it is it is not at all cool, just like that. So I was kind of uh, I was still interested. Okay, this is not about replacing anybody. This is about you know inspiring uh, human uh, creativity. But uh, that that idea was not really got you know instilled on that. So. That that's that's not a limitation. I'm not sure if it is a limitation, but I think people should have more uh, have to be more open about technology. Of course, there should be regulations. I'm not talking about an uh, utopia. I'm talking about regulation. There should be regulations, privacy concerns. Yeah, but we really not recently we all know about the privacy concerns from WhatsApp. But people should generally have you know, a wider perspective about how uh, technology is getting used. They should be aware of it. There, there should not be something like a vehement no. Uh, that that's uh, that's not cool. Yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. You know, the broader your horizons are, the more you will be able to assimilate, and then you can eventually make informed decisions as to uh, what you like, what you don't. But if you are closed from the very beginning, then doesn't leave much scope for. Uh, uh, creativity ahead. Anyway, so with that, we come to the next question. Uh, so one of our attendees has asked, uh, is it possible for fusing emotion AI technologies to create AI generated music? Yeah. So uh, if, regarding the emotion, so that's, uh, that's uh, for me, at least what I know about it is um, emotions are tough to simulate on a mathematical level. That's what I understood that, okay, I'm, I'm actually following. I also have an idea of, you know, uh, <clears throat> writing a book about layers of emotions. Okay, I have never talked about this on public, but some of my uh, you know, very uh, close, close people, they know about it. So this is the idea, think about it. Imagine someone is going through a trauma, okay? And you want to be empathetic with them, okay? But you are coming from a very different background, right? Very different background. You don't really um, ha know how she or he must have gone through that process. And you want to be emotionally connect with them. How are you going to do that? Or say something like, there's a system, okay? There's a system is actually helping you and telling you that, okay, on the mark, on the, on, on the 10, on 10, you're actually connecting, emotionally connecting with them only by six. You need to increase your empathy. Some meter is there. And they can, can empathize more. Okay, so this is actually some kind of a, a longer dream. I think it's kind of a north star I have for my you know, uh, future pursuits. But it is actually going to be really cool if, they, if we can actually mathematically model emotions. But it is really tough. So emotional layer, what we are talking about, we are actually having a very good sentiment analysis uh, classifiers and. Identifiers are there right now. Yes, it's, there are state of the art things are there still, but we some, sometimes struggle with the sarcasm, like that. It is there. There are limitations, but still we have gone a uh, long far. Uh, long. We have uh, taken that leap in that in that uh, sentiment analysis thing. But uh, I'm not sure on a general perspective or in a general form, human emotions are well mapped. So um, uh, that's an open question. That means anybody can attack it. So anyone who asked that question, please start doing it. I, I, I would love to see your uh, results on that. Thank you. I mean, definitely lots to think about in this field. I mean, it's just opening up. So, you know, there's so much more to do, um, which brings me to my next question. Uh, how much time does it take for Aurea to generate a poem accompanied by artwork? Does she to rely on creative spaces like humans for expanding her style of art? Okay, so uh, this is uh, this is something uh, so uh, something very interesting because 
see um, humans are evolving continuously okay but orlia knows only about the data she was shown okay so her learning is limited if i want to uh, update her i have to show her more data okay that's a, that's one thing so to evolve uh, so once we have that limitation about learning there will be definite time to generate an art maybe she can generate uh, if it is a uh, if it is an acute system with a lot of gpus and everything <laughs> she will be able to you know generate come up with maybe 1000 or 10000 points in a in a second <laughs> okay so it is not as painful as a human being to come up with an idea so that's where the the pitching of the idea inspiring human people human inspiring humans coming from all right okay so it, it is how it is like like say imagine ai rahman we know all about ai rahman ai rahman was told say something like uh, say i want uh, five songs and one of the songs very romantic i want that directly say something like that and rather than starting from scratch ai rahman is actually starting from i'm not saying that he should do it no i'm not i'm not saying that but he's actually starting from a five generated samples Okay, which is which takes very little time for an artificial agent to uh, you know generate. Okay. If we can do that, then his creative process is actually getting a bit you know less hectic. I'm 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 sure. Okay, he don't want to do that. Anybody don't want to dilute. They if they call it dilution or whatever. I don't I don't know. But this is this is something we want it to be. You know, uh, so that's uh, that's a question. Comparing to a human artist, it's very very quick. For a virtual yeah. office to generate ideas, that's it. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the next question that we have here is: Is Aria? Yeah. Aria... Think, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, is Aria available for the public to transform poems to images? Is it an open source platform? Can we access it? Yeah. So uh, we uh, have, we are uh, you know uh, very strong advocates of open source code. so everything whatever i have done with my with my project it's actually my like it is done okay uh, me and fabin both of us are strong advocates of open source code so it is actually available for you guys to experiment with okay do what you want to do with it okay nothing malicious but it is constructive in that sense okay so you can do that also the underlying algorithms that is attention gap we have used for this text image it is actually again it is open source coming from microsoft research you can go to the repository or maybe you can go to uh, you know my uh, github handle and you can understand you, can, you will get almost every technical aspect of it from that simple repo okay that's uh, that's how i have written that documentation okay so yeah that's wonderful thing. um we've linked your uh, social media handles your website as well as uh, the aria uh, website in our chat so i would request all our attendees to look at the chat and access whatever link uh, seems most um, perfect to your requirements um and with that i'd like to ask you another question um uh, So, according to you, uh, when you came up with this project, what was the main purpose that you had in mind? Uh, actually, uh, that's that that that's also I mentioned here. Fabian and I, we wanted to create something. We, you know, that's the that was the only thing. There was we had no idea that this is going to be this is going to get get the. so much attention and media coverage or we will go to italy and you know present it there or no we will get the collaboration from it is no we just wanted to you know do something uh, create something that's what we wanted just that's what we wanted and everything else is you know came along the way there was no such purpose of you know building this no there's nothing was there we just wanted to get that joy from creating that's it that's a sincere answer yeah very uh very truthful and uh, from the heart <laughs> i would say <laughs> that answer was um okay so mr paul the next question that we have here is um 
do you as a machine learning engineer have concerns about how ai will take over humans or the ethical implications of ai in our day to day lives what is your personal take on this thing? okay okay let me tell you something about okay uh, see um, when electricity came uh, a lot of people had the same issue when photography was found a lot of people had a lot of issues like okay it's going to be you know, what happened before photography a lot of artists used to draw your portraits that's what happened so all of them thought that okay once photography is found these people will be jobless but what really happened what really happened was surrealism was born okay a lot of new art uh, uh, you know art regimes was found just because photography took into the portrait place so that's what i'm saying see these AI or whatever the technology is, you have to evolve. That's what it should be. You can't be stuck. Uh, we are actually above all. We are actually the human beings who are, who are actually coming from the nap, the, the survival of the fittest. It's coming in there. I'm not saying that. Okay, you have to evolve. You know, completely. You know, black to white. I'm not saying that. But there should be periodic evolving. Should be there, and that's how we can actually catch up with. You know, you. You you can't miss the boat. That that's how we can actually do that. And about the jobs, I'm telling you, okay, there will be some jobs will be replaced by AI, yeah. but that will create new jobs. And something like a Terminator thing, that's never gonna happen. In at least in, in, uh, in at least in our lifetimes, that's what I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the Terminator is out of this. Well, that's that's very wonderful. Um, okay, so. The next question that we have here is probably going to be the last one, uh, and after that we'll take your uh, last words. Okay, so this question says, "How promising is the use of AI in composing lyrical pieces in addition to poems and uh, how, art?" How, uh, how promising is how promising. Uh, the use of AI in composing lyrical pieces? Mm -hmm. So it is almost the same as uh, the the same process we have done for the point generation. It is. You feed the lyrics and you get the lyrics. That's how it works. It's again language modeling. But the thing I want to tell you uh, is maybe I really, I personally don't want it to be used. You know, hello. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I really don't want it to be used in you know in a role level. I want uh, someone to start from that idea and start uh, you know. Uh, by building new perspective to it, a human perspective, because whatever it be, AI models, they are software models, they are mathematical models, they are actually seeing this as one sense zeros. They might not be able to interpret it philosophically or otherwise. So they are just doing what they are, you know, what they are uh, directed to do. That's what is happening. Maybe it will change. Maybe it will change. Maybe in coming years they they could change, but. Currently, it is what it is. So I really want, uh, if someone is actually doing something like that, a creative pursuit like that, okay, generating artificial lyrics for uh, their upcoming movie, I would say, okay, uh, if you want to do it as a cool stuff, like a cool stuff, uh, do it, it's fine. But I always feel that uh, a human inter interpretation and intervention should be there. And human artists should, should take it up from there. It should not be presented in the wrong all form. It should be presented with, you know, adding human value to it, and that's all. Because art is something uh, we we are actually making a uh, meaning for the art. Art at its raw form, it doesn't have a meaning. It normally is enjoying it. So that's that's what I feel about it. There should be some human interpretation. Wonderful! Thank you so much for answering all of those questions so patiently, Mr. Paul. It was an absolute uh, honor to have you at India Science Festival. If I could just take your last words um, uh, on a very inspirational note, what would you say to all our young listeners who are interested in this field and want to do something good in AI and art? Um, so um, it was actually a great platform. I I. I understood that Indian Science Festival is actually using, uh, as we, it's a big thing among the students and it's actually inspiring a lot of people. And I'm so humbled that you have given me a chance to present this idea. When uh, Shruti approached me for, for the first time, I was not at all, you know, my response was a bit cold because 
I, I understood that I, I, I won't be able to do a live demo with you guys because everything is actually almost archived. So, um, but uh, the platform, the response I've got, all these questions I've got, I understood that all of these people are actually, uh, you know, trying to make sense of this project and maybe some of uh, them are inspired to do things. So I'm so humbled, I'm so humbled to be here, to, you know, to be uh, a speaker here. Thank you very much, Indian Science First. And Shruti, thank you very much for your uh, patience and persistence to get me here. Thank you. And everyone who asked questions, or who listened to this, uh, uh, about this talk, thank you very much. Thank you for you know understanding uh, the project and asking these questions. And I hope all of you become great innovators. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Paul. It was such a pleasure listening to you, and uh, we're very very inspired by your project. And I'm sure all of our listeners have had a great time. Um, like I mentioned before, you can check out the chat and we have listed in all the links that could help you uh, figure out more details about this project. Uh, it was really lovely having you here and uh, thank you so much. Um, we hope to host you at our fest next year too. Thank Hopefully you. on you. ground. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All the best. All the best for the program. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that was a very, very interesting uh, and a fun talk to listen to because I think uh, a very novel idea that uh, Mr. Paul and uh, his uh, friends brought into uh, AI and art. So on that innovative note, let's get ready for our next talk, which promises to be um, as exciting as the previous one. It is with great pleasure that I get to welcome Dr. Bitasta Das. Could you please uh, turn on your video and audio, Dr. Das? Thank you Hello, so Shruti. much for joining us, Dr. Das. Such a pleasure to have you at India Science Festival. Same here. Same. Um, just, just give me one second. My video is hanging. Yeah. OK, so Dr. Das uh, is joining us. Uh, all the way from IISC Bangalore. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about our speaker here today. Our attendees definitely would uh, want to know more about you. So Dr. Das is an author, researcher, and teacher. Presently is the senior editor at the Office of Communications at Indian Institute of Science, one of the premier research institutions in India. She, is, um, she has published six books, and uh, one of her books is called Arting Science that explores scientific research through Indian folk art. And I'm so very excited about this talk here today because I think it's such a unique topic that more, most of our listeners might not have heard about before. And I think it's a great um, uh, session that we're all looking forward to. So Dr. Das, without any further ado, I'd just like to tell you all that um, our attendees are mostly college students, some of who are working in the field of science, uh, life sciences, technology, science communication. We have a few school students with us here today too, and a few faculty members. So Dr. Das, over to you. Thank you, Shruti. And this is a lovely audience to address, uh, I must admit. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, today what I'm basically uh, planning to do is to talk to you about the experiment that I have been conducting at the Indian Institute of Science with my course, Mapping India with the Folk Arts. So you must have, uh, you know, uh, understood India from history, from geography, politically, how you understand India in all these disciplines. What I'm trying to do here in my course is that to understand the country with the, you know, living, vibrant folk art and craft of the country. And the second part of the course explores, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, tries to establish or facilitates a dialogue between art and science. And how I do that, uh, let me, uh, you know, uh, show you. Okay, so the title today we have given to the lecture is Joining the Dot, Science Through Tribal Art and Folk Songs. So, um, you know, uh, science and art, you, you might, you know, in your mind, you must be thinking they are like the two different, uh, you know, poles, they're poles apart. As, whereas science is about certainty, accuracy, uh, art is about creativity and critical thinking. So, 
why bring science and art together and why with folk art why folk art so i would say the answer lies in understanding what is folk art so uh, you must be knowing what the in you know, folk art are you must be seeing it around you uh, the you know uh, uh, the narrative the material art and craft of the country they might be you know the songs the music the dance so india has 2000 ethnic uh, communities and uh, in the 28 uh, states and eight union territories and all of them have something of their own you know they have something specific of their own be it their dress their food their you know songs uh, the dance the you know music the theater some something is there you know uh, which the community owns so what are the characteristics of a of folk uh, category so com common people are the main spray of uh, folk art so they, it emerges from uh, the common people they are not experts they are not like the specialized people the specialized artists they uh, the common you know common people give rise to this form of art folk art may accompany the celebration of various religious social and family festive uh, familial festivals that is they are accompanied by they are they are very contextual contextual they are uh, you know uh, they might be connected to a religious uh, ceremony they might be connected to some celebration they always uh, you know uh, have something to do with the context so fertility cult is one major context where we see a lot of uh, folk art emerging be it of human and land as well as uh, the problem of natural disasters like flood famine fire disease accident uh, these are all the themes of folk art so you see the day to day affairs are uh, you know uh, uh, very central to the folk art forms textual sources or authorship is not important so you don't have a author of a folk art you don't have a suppose giving an example of uh, the bhangra you know uh, songs or the bhangra dance nobody knows who is the author is nobody knows who the uh, you know writer of the song is but it belongs to the entire community mostly orally transmitted they are not you know uh, formally taught they are not uh, uh, they don't they are not codified uh, they are orally transmitted you listen to them and you, you know remember them and you uh, you know regenerate them folk art are often a mixture of genres music dance songs drama the division into music uh, dance or drama is made based on the emphasis of the form so if you, if i can take the example of uh, madhubani art maybe so madhubani art tells you about the whole world view of the community but it uh, it is accompanied by singing but uh, the you know the prominent uh, feature is the art the visual art so we you know categorize them into visual art same is for uh, something like uh, notanki of uttar pradesh it has music it has dance it has storytelling but it, because it is more of a performative uh, you know uh, uh, it has more of performative pictures we call it a theater theater folk theater form the purpose of folk art can be summed up in three fold social transaction that is uh, it might be conveying some social message a ritualistic performance uh, you know it is done to express some you know ritual and entertainment so these are the three Uh, primary uh, functions of folk art so now the question is uh, who is a folk so there have been uh, you know in the history uh, debates about who can be called a folk and who cannot be called a folk earlier the you know the idea was people who belong to the rural community uh, who have not been touched by science, you know technology or modernization can, are all folk but the, this idea has been fading now the present idea is any group which have some cohesion in, among within them um, and they share something in common can be called a folk category that that is a scientist group can also be called a folk category or folk group any group that expresses its inner cohesion by maintaining shared tradition qualifies as folk whether the linking factor is occupation language place of residence age religion or ethnic origin so what is folk art folk art consists of the expressive genres of knowledge legend music oral history proverb jokes so these are all folk art you know it can be narrative it can be performative or it can be visual okay fairy tales stories tall tales and customs included in traditions of a culture sub or subculture or a group so these are all folk art part of folk art so these are the art of the common people so as i said it can be visual like uh, you know the madhubani painting worli painting chitra art uh, or you know um, uh, or it can be narrative 
like something like ballet uh, you know which is uh, narrative uh, performative that is uh, dance drama theater these are all uh, performative uh, you know uh, form of folk art performative folk art so what is the why does why does uh, why is, does folk art exist in the society okay what is the purpose of folk art they serve as educational tool for pre literate society so uh, where there is no formal education folk art serve as uh, the folk category serve as educational tool we'll come to the examples later guide and advises and uh, and passed on knowledge that are uh, essential for living emphasize values of the culture highlight the social and political order of the society explain the inexplicable reflect fear anxiety gratitude etc and entertainment so educational you might uh, you know have heard this kabir do hai kal kare jo aaj kar aaj kare so ab pal mein pralay hogi bahuri karugi tab so this is uh, actually telling you the importance of time so you know it is educational it is giving you some advice it is telling you to pay attention to time and respect time do your work in, you know in time essential life knowledge this is a example i am giving you from panchatantra this is a story which where uh, you know a uh, brahman brings home a, a snake uh, you know uh, but the the wife is very you know uh, not happy with this decision and uh, she keeps on doubting the snake and one day when uh, uh, you know they see a lot of blood on the floor uh, the lady thinks that the snake has eaten away the child but actually it had it had saved the child from a mongoose and uh, that's why the blood was there and they in her in haste they killed the snake but the snake was actually the friend of the family so uh, this is also to tell you that uh, don't take decision in a haste uh, you know pay attention to, uh, to the uh, nuances so these are essential life knowledges that folk art contain so values of a culture this is a gondana art uh, of uh, you know uh, the gond community of madhya pradesh so uh, so there are many community like the bishno community uh, the uh, you know the dongreya kon community who consider the nature as their ancestors okay and looking at their art we see what the values contain what is what is what you know what values are they and the the world view the you know the what they think about the world outside them social and political order uh, so the folk art this is a example i have given from uh, assam it's a gamsa it is uh, you know given to people to show respect so it folk art is also used uh, you know to uh, maintain the social and political order So explain the inexplicable. That is, some there are some things that you cannot explain. You know, you uh, with logic, like there are questions of origin. How did you know the Earth origin? So this uh, the folk art gives you such answers. Okay, this is a tree of life. Uh, you know, the understanding is that uh, uh, all life emerges from the tree. So it gives you some kind of answer about questions that you cannot explain. You know, and uh, explain easily. the so emotion of the society uh, this is a example from the nongrem festival uh, where the you know dancers are paying homage to the paying their respect to the ground who gives them you know uh, crops uh, they are actually going doing this dance for 3 uh, days and 3 nights uh, you know to show their respect they are actually performing the you know uh, activity of tilling the soil um, uh, you know through this dance and uh, it, they are showing the respect to the soil who gives them food entertainment this is a bhan pate uh, from uh, uh, jammu and kashmir where a bhan uh, would you know talk about the political order or the establishment and make fun and, you know it is a, uh, it's a release kind of uh, you know you make fun of the establishment you make fun of the political order and get some release from the uh, overburdening uh, situation so so these are some of the purposes of folk art so what makes folk art unique uh, so uh, as against uh, as against the fine art uh, folk art is not you know all about aesthetics okay it's not about it's something more folk fine art focuses more on aesthetic and is learned through formal education uh, formal instruction and training while folk art encompasses one's culture in a deeper manner folk art is mostly learned without formal training so aesthetic is not so important in folk art so i should also tell you about it you know um, 
about what is folk, uh, what is folk art and what is folk craft. So basically, both of them do not have much difference. You know, uh, both are uh, have some sense of you know uh, beauty. They have both have some sense of uh, utility. But if the utility is more, we call it craft. If the beauty, uh, you know, the aesthetic is uh, more prominent, we call it art. In folk art, context is important. As I showed you, you know, uh, it is done during some festival, some ritual. Uh, so the context is important in folk art. Okay. So looking at a folk art, you can understand, uh, you know, uh, you can actually decipher from, you know, the context from where it comes from. Folk art of large, are largely utilitarian. They have utility values. Folk art is weaved into everyday life. So, uh, you know, it is, uh, uh, it talks about the everyday life of the community it comes from. Folk art connects the past to the present. So something that is passed on from generation to generation, it connects the past to the present. Folk art reflect the worldview of a community. So it, as I showed you, you know, some of the examples, it, it gives you a reflection. It, you, by looking at them, you understand what the community thinks about the world outside. Okay, the values of the community. It gives you a window to understand the community. So why are we uh, learning folk art in uh, Indian Institute of Science? Uh, you know, this is something that I'm quoting from a report from uh, Renovation and Rejuvenation of Higher Education, uh, uh, popularly known as the Yashpal Committee Report of 2009, which, you know, this is a lament that we hear often that there is a chasm. The, you know, the natural and the social sciences don't talk to each other. And uh, as a result, uh, you know, we don't know what is happening. And there is a sense of, uh, suspicions, you know, what are the scientists doing, the humanities people would think and the scientists would think what the social science and humanities people are doing. So there's a chasm and, uh, and this has to be uh, somehow mended. A key problem haunting higher education in a country is that uh, strict separation between uh, study of natural and human world, leading to two cub cubicalized domain of knowledge, the natural and the human science which are in turn internally dominated by stratification of expertise with deep chasm in between. So this is often a lament that we hear that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, domains of knowledge don't talk to each other. So my attempt with this course was to somehow see if we can establish a dialogue between the natural and, and the social sciences to have something uh, that both of them can call their own. So aim of this endeavor, in, uh, so also the understanding is that uh, uh, we know science as something that is, you know, has a deep impact on society. It this is the domain of knowledge which, in, which can immediately, which has the potential to immediately and very effectively, you know, uh, affect the society. And that is why there is a need, there is a, you know, uh, uh, you know, necessity that uh, the scientists who are doing the science uh, should be you know, grounded in the society should be knowing the realities of the society in order to sign that the science and technology community provide effective leadership in matters of development, agriculture, industry, and health. And in order to ensure that knowledge and production takes into account the interpenetration of natural and human world, we need a broader concept of science and its deep and complex relation with society and culture. We actually don't need scientists who are doing their, you know, uh, science inside the lab, but they should be also cognizant of what is happening around them. What is the reality and what, what is the society in which they are doing the science. So that this have been my endeavors. That is, uh, you know, to somewhere see if we can establish a dialogue and also to see how, uh, you know, uh, the scientists or the people who are doing science are aware of the society they are in. So what is my, what has been my pedagogic approach? The pedagogic approach is to say, is to establish that science and scientists are part of the society, they're not removed from the society. Scientific and technological excellence cannot be attained without accounting for human and environmental concerns. They should be very central to scientific, uh, you know, research and scientific uh, activities. Folk art is one way is one way to understand the hope, aspiration, and worldview of the, uh, you know, of the society. At the same time, is a medium to appreciate the knowledge of common people. So, folk art as I showed you, uh, you know, gives you a glimpse of the, uh, the worldview of the community. And it's, it also is the beauty, beauty of it, you know, lies, you know, in understanding and appreciating the knowledge from which it comes from, from the context, from the common people that it comes from. 
So let me give you a glimpse of what I have been doing at Indian Institute of Science. Um, so this is one book we had published uh, in 2016, Arting Science. So I had asked the students to depict. So in at uh, IASC, what I do every year, I take one uh, art form, be it visual, performative, or narrative, and uh, we understand the country with that art form. Suppose in, in one year, I have taken a visual art form, the paintings. And we try to see what are the different kinds of paintings that are found in the uh, you know, different parts of the country. And we try to understand the region through that art form. So um, uh, we had uh, compiled one book uh, with the paintings that uh, you know, uh, this, our students had done. Uh, the assignment I had given them was to show a scientific discovery through a uh, you know, folk art of the country. I'll give you, show you some example. This is not exhaustive, but I'm just giving you a glimpse. So this is Mendel's first law of inheritance through Madhubani painting. You can see the, uh, you know, a very, you know, uh, typical, the lotus, the snake, the tortoise, uh, the fish uh, used in Madhubani painting, the boundaries that are used. And they're showing, this is actually showing the Mendel's first law of inheritance, how the, you know, dominant and recessive alleles are shown. This is accretion in Whirly. Uh, accretion is the phenomenon of, of physics where uh, it is said that the mass uh, of object of bigger mass, you know, pulls the uh, object of uh, smaller mass. So here they are showing, the students have shown how uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the uh, town, the city is pulling the people from the villages and how that, you know, uh, that uh, the cities are growing, whereas the towns are uh, sorry, the villages are becoming smaller, accretion. So this is wormhole in Kalighat style painting. So here uh, the students have shown how the zero was actually discovered in um, India, but uh, you know, was uh, popularized by the traders outside. This is cherial painting and it's showing phagocytosis, uh, that is the antibody and antigen, uh, you know, uh, fight. Uh, cherial painting is very typical of Telangana. Uh, so where this, sorry, I should tell you the places where they come from. Uh, this is Kalikhat painting of West Bengal. This is a Christian worldly uh, painting of Maharashtra. This is Madhubani of uh, Bihar, Madhubani painting of Bihar. So this is serial painting of uh, Telangana and, uh, and uh, Andhra Pradesh where this is actually uh, a war painting and the, typically it is, it has a red background and you most of the times you show a war scene. So here the students have shown phagocytosis, how when a disease come to attack you, how the antigen in your body try to, uh, you know, counter them. So uh, this is what is shown here, phagocytosis. So another year we had a folk theater festival. The students were asked to show uh, some of the, you know, issues of the country uh, with, um, you know, they could choose a scientific theory uh, or uh, some issues of the country and they give how a scientist would, uh, you know, actually understand them or how a scientist would uh, counter them. So first one was actually very beautifully done. It was shadow puppetry. Uh, they were showing Dar Darwin's theorem. Then they showed anthropocentric worldview of human beings in Nortenke style. They showed, uh, you know, Chow, they had shown this, uh, you know, uh, the tri tribal struggles in Chow. So in the, that way, various you know issues were shown through folk theater. Another we, year we had uh, folk dance. So here, what I had asked the students: so our students take uh, majors in. So these are all science students that I am teaching, and humanities is part of that course. Humanities, our students are uh, you know doing the bachelor's degree. It's a four years bachelor degree, and humanities is compulsory from first to sixth semester. So uh, in uh, this four years, our students take. Uh, major in one of the subjects, physics, chemistry, maths, biology, environmental science, or material science. So I had asked the students to, uh, in the six disciplines to choose one groundbreaking research and to show it through a dance, folk dance. So uh, the chemistry student showed, uh, you know, the Haber's process uh, through Dolo Kunutya of Karnataka. The mathematics students showed the four color theorem uh, through Kalvelia of Rajasthan. Uh, uh, they, uh, the physics students showed Koitapattu and they were showing the gravitational uh, waves and universe expansion. The material science students showed material properties and uh, microscopy through Kuttu dance of Tamil Nadu. 
this Koitapattu uh, is of Kerala, and uh, the biology group showed CRISPR in Lavni, and they Earth and environmental science students showed uh, the plastic eating worms through uh, uh, Vira dance. So these are some of the groundbreaking research in each of this discipline, and they have showed it through a dance form. So and uh, another year, it was more of thematic. We were talking about the you know the issues uh, that the tribal community of our country face, and uh, you know we rightly called it uh, Jal Jungle Zameen because. Of, uh, the you know entire tribal struggle or entire tribal you know uh, livelihood is based on jal jangan zameen their entire life is around this features of nature and uh, and i asked the student to show me tell me what has science uh, you know put jal jangan zameen vis a vis science and see what they think about you know i left it open to them i put jal jangan zameen and tribal struggle at one one you know uh, at, at one uh, spot and science and technology at another spot and ask them to reflect on this both two things you know these two domains and uh, it was amazing that uh, you know three distinct uh, you know thought process emerged and which they reflected which they showed through the art and some students felt that there's always a conflict between jal jungal zameen and tribal issues and science here you know one of the groups showed how it is like the snake is eating its own tail that is human beings are reaching its own end you know through uh, unaccounted development another group showed uh, through uh, this uh, this was first one was from uh, you know through gone painting second was from uh, second was through uh, assam manuscript painting where they showed that human beings have developed all these things and they are destroying the nature you know and um, unaccounted development and unaccounted you know uh, greed has led to this then uh, a second group of students felt that uh, sorry this i'm showing just uh, you know some examples of it these are not exhaustive i'm just giving you a glimpse of what the students feel about it so another group of uh, another groups of students felt that uh, there is confluence that science technology can very, very nicely merge with the uh, you know tribal issues the, uh, of the country like uh, and also with you know uh, nature the jal jungle zameen and uh, see if, if with the uh, in the first example uh, through miniature painting they are showing cloud seeding how you know uh, science and technology can uh, rightly influence uh, the environment uh, another group showed uh, uh, through gone painting again uh, the uh, elephant corridor how science, you know scientific thinking can actually help the uh, you know the flora and fauna of the country another third group of student felt that there can be novel ideas there can be novel uh, you know uh, creation you know uh, when science comes uh, you know uh, uh, comes uh, face to face with uh, jal jungal zameen and the tribal issues like first student uh, one of the group of students showed that uh, you know uh, through uh, this pichwai painting they showed that uh how uh, dna can be you know um, mutated to show uh, to bring crowd, uh, drought resistant plants another group of students showed the discovery of the carnet engine to give you know maximum uh, energy another group of stu students showed how science has science and technology has actually helped to um, you know uh, restore the coral reef so this the first one is through uh, uh, pichwai painting this is chitra painting uh, the orange background and the third one is uh, again uh, gon painting uh, of madhya pradesh so uh, i think uh, my time is getting over so i leave you with one uh, song so this was another group of okay after that we have done a few more uh, you know groups i have uh, taught and uh, some of uh, in one group i had asked the students to detail the folk tales uh, from a scientific perspective if science was a major you know uh, domain how would the uh, folk tales change uh, for the want of time i'm not sure giving you examples here and another group that is recently concluded i asked the students to give analysis scientific analysis of the folk recipes you know food so i'll leave you with one song uh, uh, so this batch was asked to talk about the scientific processes uh, the you know in our nature uh the uh, true folk songs so this is a boatman song of of kerala and they are talking about the water cycle
Uh, Shruti, can you hear? Uh, no, Dr. Das, uh, we're not able to hear. You might have to turn on your desktop sound. So okay. when you go to screen sharing. Now? Can you hear, Shruti? Uh, no, I, I can't hear anything. Yeah. Can you increase the volume, please? Yeah. I think that is the maximum I can go. Okay, I'll end with that and I, we can take some questions. Right, and Dr. Das, that was really lovely. Uh, I'm just going to uh, take your screen sharing off so that um, yeah. our audience members can see you. So um, we have some very, very exciting questions and I'm really excited about this Q&A bit. Um, firstly, I, would, I really want to thank you for the efforts that you put in bringing this presentation together. It was so interesting to see how beautifully you link the science with the art bit, especially um, what really stayed with me was the uh, um, Madhubani art that you showed relating it with the Mendelian uh, inheritance that, that really stayed with me. It was so fascinating to see. And uh, and thanks for sharing all the visuals of all the students at IISE uh, presenting us a, a dance uh, to explain science. I think that's so interesting. So um, the questions that we have here are uh, very uh, in, uh, thought provoking, I think, and we're excited to know your answers. Mm -hmm. The first question here is, uh, how can we use folk art uh, in rural an underdeveloped area. So this is something that we're working on in uh, Bangalore, which is a city. How can we take this to rural areas in India? So I think folk art has a lot of potential. Folk art, uh, you know, uh, why I say this is because folk art uh, is very close to everyone. Um, I, for one, I'm very close to the art forms from my own state, uh, from Karnataka also. Uh, they have this potential of reaching out to the masses. So if you have any, you know, issues to be uh, conveyed, I think folk art is a very, very good medium. Uh, and I have seen the government, some of the government, uh, you know, agendas also being, you know, uh, conveyed through folk art. The early, has, you know, art has been used by the health department to talk about how, you know, uh, certain uh, uh, disease prevention and, uh, you know, uh, all those issues. So I think we should all use these, you know, art forms, which actually belongs to the community to talk about issues, you know, to talk about, to convey the issues effectively. I think they have a very big potential. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so the next question that we have here is uh, quite good. So one of our attendees is from Iser and said that we are not very encouraged to do cultural activities, nor do we have separate credits associated with these um, you know, social activities in our university. So mm -hmm. how do we encourage science institutes to give more courses and credits for extra co-curricular activities like these? What is your take yeah, on so, this? 
so i think at iisc we have been lucky we, uh, we it's not much it's this nine credit in this four, uh, four year uh, undergraduate course but still it's compulsory all the students have to do the humanities uh, you know uh, they have to take this humanities subject it's not optional for them so i thought iisa is a fashion uh, after iisc and uh, um, the humanities should have been uh, you know important uh, portion it's sad to know it's not you know the case but i think it will show, slowly change and uh, yeah i can only say that our students are lucky that uh, the curriculum has been designed this way you know that takes me to my next question so uh, we've been asked here how exactly did uh, uh, what is your take on incorporating humanities in a science institution at an earlier stage in undergrad uh, how important do you think it is i think it's very very important because uh, you know okay i should say i start my classes i am lucky to take the first class of the first undergraduate semester and i start my classes by asking the students is humanities important yeah for the science student and 50% of the students would say no it's not important we have come here to do science yeah. but 50% do say that it is uh, important but by the end of the sixth semester everyone thinks that how humanities is you know important it gives you a grounding in the society it makes you understand the society and you're not doing science in vacuum you're not you know uh, you know uh, just doing your science in your lab but you have to one you know face the society you have to work for the society so i think it should be nicely integrated not just something that is you know uh, superficially there uh, just to you know fulfill some uh, you know criteria but it should be well connected well you know integrated in the science uh, you know uh, curriculum it's very important otherwise we'll be having scientists who wouldn't you no know, care for what is happening around you so very important like i mean i think the whole idea is to bring together science and society and that is yeah. what uh, you know uh, the course that you have designed is aiming to do uh, which takes me to my next question uh, it says what was your inspiration behind developing a course like this what drew you towards combining science with art because i do know that your background per se is in hardcore science uh, yes. so yeah. what drew you towards this so my uh, background i have done bsc botany then i went on to do cultural studies but the cultural studies that i did uh, i did masters in cultural studies the culture that the ma program there had a big chunk of folkloristic but there were other things as well so uh, i did my phd in a completely different uh, subject i did on ethnic assertions uh, of assam but when i was asked to design a course for the undergraduate students i thought that i should give them something that is hands on and they can they see around them and you know they can uh, you know they can feel it because these are very impressionable uh, you know students of uh, teenagers who come and they are at the stage of becoming you know uh, adults and they should be given uh, something that they can relate to uh, so that was what my intention was to you know uh, make them understand the necessity of you know one was diversity we should also respect and understand the diversity of this country and the beauty of this country and true live and vibrant things you know not not textual not you know yeah. but something that they can see they can feel you know so that was my inspiration to make the student understand the diversity make the student appreciate the country with the living objects you know dynamic so, objects that that's very fascinating dr das uh, you know you have spoken about what inspires you but you know the stereotype that surround scientific institutions is that everything is uh, you know uh, associated with a laboratory with hardcore research there's no time to do anything outside of uh, the lab work that you're invested in now how exactly do you convince your students to take part in activities like these where they might not they might be thinking that they're here just to do science yeah so it is a little uh, they need a little bit of convincing a little bit of push but i make sure that they do it these are like assignments these are like their you know final exam so they have to do it uh, but they enjoy it it's not that they don't enjoy they at the end of first they will say that we can't do ma'am dance i have never done in my life uh, you know but i said this is your assignment you are supposed to do this then at the end of it they'll come back and say this is my first time i have done dance and i have enjoyed it they need a little bit push but at the end of the day they enjoy it that's what i have felt in all this 7 8 years that, that i have taught at iisc so shruti i should also tell you this uh, 
I should also tell you this that uh, some way there was you know questioning. Uh, I mean, I would question myself whether I am trying to appropriate the folk art of this country. You know, we are not folk artists. We are not uh, from the community that we are you know trying to uh, you know represent. But but the beauty lies there in the folk art. The beauty lies there that it gives you a lot, lot of flexibility. And we have this. I, I bring the artisans from you know different Chitra community, Bandhubani community to teach our students. to do this art forms i brought uh, you know dancer uh, to show them dolokunita it's not that we are just looking at something and try to imitate it but i make sure that the artisans the practitioners themselves come to the to the institute uh, they walk in the institute to talk to the scientists they make the students uh, learn them so this has been my one of my other endeavor to you know make the artisans really come and talk to the students yeah. well definitely that uh, you know that's such a wonderful thing that you just shared with us because i think the very fact that these folk artists are coming in to you know mm -hmm. present their side of the story to the students mm -hmm. so then uh, at the end of the day we become sort of uh, the middlemen in the process mm -hmm. but you know when you actually have someone from the from the field speaking to these students it becomes so much more uh, interesting and uh, uh, relatable i would say mm -hmm. uh, okay so the next question that we have here for you is um, how how exactly do you see uh, initiatives like these busting pseudo scientific or unscientific uh, news around us how effective do you think folk art or tribal art can be in response to this question i just have to say that uh, folk art or tribal art are very honest you know they are honest to the core there's nothing superficial about it they are grounded in the nature they are grounded in you know uh, moral they grounded in the values you know talking about the environment about in nature if you appreciate them you really appreciate uh, the truth you know this is all i have to say and that's really lovely and and that came straight from your heart i can see that yeah. <laughs> so okay so the next question that we have here is this communication of scientific ideas through folk art say for example dance or music only involve non verbal communications are there any language barriers that need to be overcome because no actually what uh, the song i played for you um, you know uh, that was an example that i encouraged the students to use vernacular language from the community they come from you know uh, there are songs where they have written in odia they have written in you know kannada they have written in malayalam so i asked the students to you know use their own languages and you know that is the beauty of it you know to you know using your own language and developing something that is new so i encourage them to do that and the results has been fantastic so we have seen one i i, I wish i could play uh, in that um, kalbelia uh, you know dance a bengali boy was actually singing a rajasthani song you know so they want to do that you know there's a urge that they would like to do something and he did a fantastic job it's not that you know he did some shoddy job or anything he did wonderful so these are things you know this is the beauty of the country that you know you appreciate the diversity you you know try and learn it yeah absolutely very well said that uh, dr dash we have received so many questions for you I, obviously our audience was very very impressed by our talk but unfortunately we have to move on to our next session but before mm -hmm. we do that i'm just going to take your last comments on ISF and what your personal take is how do you think uh, events like these um, are helpful in bringing science and art together because ISF really aims at you know bringing forth different collaborators together on one platform and the very fact that we got to hear about your work which is so unique in our country not many people are doing this so how important do you think uh, public engagement and platforms are to uh, speak to society and bring together different yeah so i have always been a you know propounder of interdisciplinary you know knowledge uh, because i feel that if you are sitting in your own you know straight jacketed boundaries there's nothing exciting happening but push the boundaries and you'll see a lot of exciting things are happening in, in the boundaries so yeah I, I, india uh, science festival is doing exactly what it should be doing that pushing the boundaries and you know bringing 
spot many you know, new knowledges. Yeah, there'll be doubts, of course, uh, like I used to have uh, while giving an assignment to the student, whether it's the right, right thing to do, whether you know, the students will be able to uh, represent what will be the response from the scientific community. Am, am I, you know, uh, trying to, you know, do something that I should not be doing, touching the four cards in one hand and touching science another hand, both are like two complex uh, domains of knowledge. Am I trying to do something that I should not be doing? These are questions that will emerge, but we have to keep on pushing boundaries. Only then, you know, uh, there'll be a dialogue, there'll be, you know, uh, there'll be a change among one another. And thank you, India Science Festival, for doing this and, you know, letting people, you know, giving a platform to, you know, talk about the work and also, you know, uh, encouraging people to think in different new novel ways. Thank you so much, Dr. Das. It was such a pleasure hosting you at India Science Festival. I think the, I think you really grazed the stage with your beautiful session and our our attendees have a lot of good things to say about you. So I just want everybody to know that we have linked uh, Dr. Das's uh, website in the chat so you can have a look at her work and can also uh, uh, read more about her uh, work and her books. So make sure that you uh, have a look at the chat before uh, this session finishes. And mm -hmm. with that, that Dr. Das, thank you so much for coming and we hope to host you again at the festival uh, hopefully it's offline, it's on ground somewhere and we, we really hope to see more of you uh, in the science thank communication. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for all the coordination you have been doing for so many months. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Das. Thank you. Bye. All right, that was a super interesting talk. And I think so many of us le learned something very, very unique uh, through Dr. Das's talk. And it was definitely something that most of us have not heard about before. So I think that's really lovely. I, I would encourage everybody to leave their um, opinions in our feedback form. You can see a, a, a link that has been left in your uh, chat box. Uh, please make sure that you leave us uh, your feedback because we really want to improve our upcoming sessions for all of you and make uh, the festival more accessible for everybody. And on that note, I'd like to tell you all that we organized a very interesting science fiction writing competition at our festival uh, called Spin Your Science, in which we invited um, sci-fi enthusiasts to write stories and poems from all over the world. And this was the first time uh, India Science Festival conducted this competition and we got so many entries. And uh, we shortlisted a few entries and one of our finalists, Melissa, is going to read out her entry for the science fiction competition to all of you. Melissa, could I pre uh, please request you to turn on your video and audio? Sorry, <laughs> it's a little bit blurry. Oh my God, wow, sorry. That's all right. Uh, Melissa, are you ready uh, with your uh, story? Yes. Hi. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, All right. Over to you then. Okay. Uh, the story is called Motherboard. Um, Emma had promised herself when her son Alex was born that she wouldn't shelter him, that she would let him run fast and jump high and explore the world fearlessly. But she was unprepared for the awe-inspiring power of her love for him, how she knew from the first moment she held him that she would do anything to keep him safe. All this was going through her mind as she saw him fall from a tree. Her limbs seemed frustratingly slow as she ran towards him, his small body still on the grass below. Two huge blue eyes looked up at her, and it wasn't until she wrapped him in her arms that he, and, that he began to cry. Examining his tiny body, she saw his arm was twisted at a sickening angle. She gently held it in her hands, bracing herself for the sight of bone. Instead, protruding from beneath the blood, was what looked like the back of a computer. She dropped the arm suddenly, causing Alex to cry harder. The sound of her child's pain brought her back. Quickly, she lifted him in her arms and ran towards the car. Breaking countless rules of the road on her way to the hospital, she called her husband, Will, and told him to meet them there. She didn't mention her glimpse of circuitry, beginning to wonder if it had been real or if it had been a side effect of shock. As she bundled Alex in her arms and carried him off to the ER, she stole another look, and there it was again, the dark tangle of wires and metal beneath Alex's skin. Emma hardly had a moment to consider what it meant before a nurse was upon him, ushering Alex onto a stretcher and placing some paperwork in Emma's hands. She fired a barrage of questions 
about allergies and blood type, which Emma tried her best to answer, all while wondering what had happened to her son and what was hiding beneath his skin. The nurse thanked her and told her she could see him soon. Where are you taking him? Emma asked, but she was already gone. She sat on one of the waiting room chairs, staring blankly at the outdated magazines and coffee stains on the table. In what could have been hours or minutes later, Will burst through the door, frantically searching from side to side. He spotted her and they embraced. Where's Alex? Is he all right? Will said breathlessly. He's okay. The doctors are with him now. They said we could see him soon, Emma replied. She lowered her voice. Will, there's something else. She tried to describe what she had seen on Alex's arm, but she could tell from Will's face that he didn't understand her or maybe just didn't believe her. She was about to explain further when a doctor entered, elegant and distant in her lab coat. Mr. and Mrs. Conway, I'm Dr. Cohen. This way, please. She gestured down a long, brightly hit, lit hall, and they quickly followed. Near the end, she opened a door to an office. We're not going to see Alex, Will asked anxiously. In a moment, there's a few things we need to discuss first. Not to worry, though, he's going to be perfectly fine, she reassured him. Tentatively, they sat down across from her, and she fixed them with a look of intent. Which one of you was with him during the accident? I was, Emma said. Dr. Cohen nodded. Did you notice anything unusual at the point of injury? I thought I might have seen something. Emma was hesitant to say more. Dr. Cohen smiled. You needn't be afraid, Emma. Tell me what, what did you see? I saw, I mean, I think I saw circuits beneath his skin. I'm sure my wife was under a lot of stress, Will attempted to explain, but Dr. Cohen interrupted. No, your wife is correct. They both stared at her dumbly, heads filled with a million questions, all of which seemed impossible to ask. I don't understand, Emma finally uttered. Alex's birth was difficult, yes? There were complications? Dr. Cohen asked, examining the file open in front of her. Yes, he was premature a few weeks. I had to have an emergen emergency cesarean, Emma confirmed. Dr. Cohen continued to stare at the file. Finally, she shut it, looking up at them with the same unrelenting gaze. Forgive me, Mr. and Mrs. Conway. I'm not known for my bedside manner, so I'm simply going to deliver the facts as clearly and concisely as I can. The child you carried, the one you delivered on October 21st, 2053, was stillborn. I'm sorry for your loss. Fortunately, at the time, the hospital was part of an experimental pilot program in conjunction with Icarus Industries, which you probably know for its breakthroughs in the field of artificial intelligence. Emma shook her head. I'm sorry, you must have us confused with someone else. Our baby didn't die. Alex is alive. In fact, he's here. She started to get up, but Dr. Cohen continued on. The child you carried died, but to spare you from that pain, that unimaginable grief, he was replaced by Gaia, Icarus's most advanced model of AI. Emma sat down with a dull thud. Alex's face flashed between shock, anger, and confusion. The system is really astounding, the first of its kind. While previous models were limited in their scope and programming, Gaia adapts and responds to its environment, its surroundings, just like a child would. This is some sort of sick joke. Who are you? Who do you work for? Will demanded. I understand that this is a lot to accept. I work for the hospital's bioengineering and robotics department. Our work with Icarus has primarily been focused on amputees until Gaia. Dr. Cohen seemed entirely unaffected by his outburst. So what are you saying, that Alex isn't human? Out, Emma asked. Before today's incident, did you have any indication that Alex was anything other than an ordinary six-year-old? She asked the question as if she were simply inquiring after his health. Well, no, but that doesn't change the fact that we were lied to. We were never even asked. We would never have agreed to this, Will said. Dr. Cohen calmly opened the file and pulled out a document covered in fine print with both of their signatures at the bottom. You both consented. Will snatched the document from her hands and read it through, through it furiously. We didn't know. We didn't understand. We thought our child was about to die. We would have signed anything. Our child did die. Emma trailed off. The child you carry did, yes, Emma. But is Alex not still your child? Did you not raise him, care for him, love him? What is a child, if not that? Under Dr. Cohen's gaze, Emma felt flustered. None of it felt real to her. Was it only that morning that she had been pouring Alex Cheerios, discussing what to bring for their picnic in the park? She remembered how they used to say good morning, Alex kissing the tip of his finger and pressing it against her lips. No, it's nothing like that. This isn't a limb, this is our son. 
Don't act as though you're doing this selflessly. I know what Icarus is like. Anything for the sake of advancement, no matter what the human cost, Will declared emphatically. Emma remained quiet. Her mind was a flood of memories coming over each to see if there was any sign, any way she could have known. Dr. Cohen remained stoic. As you wish, if you feel as though your relationship toward Alex has been changed irrevocably, Icarus will take over custody of his care. His memories will be erased, of course, to prevent any potential abandonment issues. Wait, Emma interjected. You would take him? Take Alex? It's not Alex, Emma. It's a robot, Will said firmly. Emma looked panicked. I know this is overwhelming, but let's just think about this, Will. He's our son. We raised him. Did we? What was us? What was the program? It's not going to be the same now, Em. Everything he does, everything he says, we're going to question it. Wonder if it, what was real and what was engineered. Tears began to stream down her face. But I love him. That's what they wanted, Will said, casting a dark look at Dr. Cohen, who remained unmoved. Emma was quiet for a long time, then took a deep breath. Can I see him to say goodbye? Dr. Cohen nodded. Alex was asleep on a hospital bed, his arm carefully wrapped in a sling. He stirred as they approached. Mommy, Daddy! Emma went to kiss him, but Will hung back. She knelt and Alex kissed his finger, holding it to her lips. She kissed it back, then lifted him up. Emma, where are you going, Will whispered. Home. Thanks so much, Melissa. That was really interesting. Um, thank you so much for sharing your uh, entire story with us. And I must say that your storytelling skills are also great. I think I know why you made it to the finals of the competition. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Um, and I hope uh, that all our judges um, give you great points for this uh, session. And uh, let's keep our fingers crossed for the results of this competition. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melissa. And uh, with that, I am going to uh, just uh, do a quick announcement. Uh, we have a very fascinating talk next. So we're going to be uh, hosting Dr. Erica Wagner from Blue Origin, who's going to be talking about living and working in space, after which we are going to have a very um, insightful discussion on space science and science fiction. So all you space enthusiasts do stick around till um, the very end of these sessions, because we have some very, very cool sessions planned for you. Um, I think on that note, it gives me great pleasure to invite Dr. Erica Wagner uh, to the stage. Dr. Wagner, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you for having me. Dr. Wagner is the payload sales director at Blue Origin and, uh, and has a very uh, wonderfully interesting background in aerospace as well as biomedical engineering. And she's going to be talking about working and living in space. Dr. Wagner, again, such a pleasure to have you at our festival our uh, space enthusiasts in the audience are absolutely raring to hear you talk. So um, without any further ado, over to you. Great, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Let me see if we can get these slides shared and then we will be off to the races. Let's see here. How are we doing there? Perfect. Fantastic. Well, I have the good fortune to get to do every day something that I'm super passionate about and love, and that is to open up the doors to space to the rest of the world, to all of us. It's really interesting when you look at the history of space, how narrow that access has been and how wide it's becoming. Uh, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that story and a little bit about some of the things I think about day to day of a future of living and working in space. Now at Blue Origin, we are a commercial space flight company. And that's something that didn't even exist when I was in high school. Uh, I think it's really interesting to think about this emergence of a whole different way of accessing space. It's not just national space agencies, but also uh, entrepreneurial ventures and a really exciting dynamic world of, of commercial activity. When we are talking about space at Blue Origin, we're thinking about a future where there are millions of people living and working in space for the benefit of Earth. 
Now, that's easy to say and hard to do. And we have a really incredible team of, of engineers and lawyers and businessmen and women uh, and designers and so on that are all working to help us make this future possible. But when you think about the why, you know, we, we keep coming back to Earth. And it's kind of funny for a space company, but when we've looked around the solar system, you know, we've been to all the planets in the solar system now, at least robotically, and Earth is still by far the best planet. If we were choosing where to live, this is the place we wanna be. But it's finite. We only have so much resources here on our planet and we wanna make sure that we take care of it and steward it for many, many generations to come. Space is really interesting for a lot of reasons, but one of those is that it has abundant resources. It has abundant you know, space, room, land. Uh, it has abundant energy. It has abundant mineral resources. It even has abundant water. And when we think about a future where we continue to grow and thrive here on Earth, space needs to become a part of that dialogue. Space is also incredibly uh, interesting as a place. And when I think about space, I have been dreaming since I was a young girl about a day when I can go and do this, just to look down at our incredible planet and, and see it in all of its glory. And, and I think it's really interesting to think about what it means when not just a few astronauts get to go, but all of us get to go to space. And I spend a lot of my time trying to figure out how do we open those doors wider and wider? How do we democratize space for you and me? Now, some futures uh, look like this. This is a, a design from the 1970s of a giant round toroid, a, a giant donut in the sky uh, where we can actually create gravity and create communities. Uh, it's a far cry from what we saw in the Apollo days, but a really beautiful future. Thinking not just about the science and the engineering and the technology, but also about the humanity that comes as we move off planet in bigger and bigger numbers. How do we make sure that this is a good community? How do we make sure it has all the things that, that we need to not just survive as humans, but to thrive? Other more recent futures take a, a little bit uh, different view of what that could look like and, and imagine cities, skyscrapers, uh, vertical farming, and all sorts of other industrial technologies that would come into play. Or maybe our future in space is a much more expansive natural one. How do we think about bringing the best things of Earth with us into space, uh, you know, both in terms of, of ecosystems uh, and in terms of our interactions with them? So when I think about where that leads us, I start by thinking backwards just a little bit. And the history of space travel has been a fairly modest one, an exciting one, but a modest one so far. The first human to ever travel uh, in, into space, Yuri Gagarin, did so in 1961. And we raced into a Cold War uh, competition between the Soviet Union and the United States that drove the first couple of decades of, of space exploration. And then we started to move into an era where space became driven more by science and by discovery and by uh, the opportunities to, to really do some incredible research. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But where we're moving now is to an era where we say, well, it took us about 50 years to get to the first 500 astronauts and cosmonauts and taikonauts that had ever flown to space. But how do we get to 5,000 people? How do we get to millions? And I think that we're just at the cusp of that turn uh, as we start to talk about commercial space exploration and living and working in space. Now, as I said, uh, I have a, a dream of going to space myself someday. I haven't gotten to go yet, uh, but I have gotten to do some really exciting stuff. And one of those was a trip uh, on what they call the Vomit Comet. Uh, this is an airplane that flies like a giant roller coaster in the sky. Uh, big waves about 10,000 to 15,000 feet tall. And then really fun thing about these airplanes, these parabolic flights, is that at the top of those hills, just like at the top of a roller coaster, you start to fall at the same rate as the aircraft. And that's kind of a funny concept. But when we, when we talk about being in space and microgravity or zero G, 
you know, some people think you actually get rid of gravity in space. That's not true. You just fall at the same rate as your vehicle. And that's true in orbit and it's true in these airplanes. And on the aircraft, you get about 10 or 15 seconds of pure weightlessness. And it's a really incredible thing to be able to dance on the ceiling uh, or to be able to float in midair. But it's also really interesting from a science perspective. And I wanna talk a little bit about what that brings us. So first I want a, a thought exercise. And this is for you to sort of get in your head. Think about your future community that's living and working in space. Maybe it's like one of those space settlements we looked at earlier. Maybe it's something totally different. But you come home from working uh, during the day or you're, you're home for dinner. What does dinner look like? Where do you sit? Do you sit down at all? What does your meal look like? What does your beverage look like? I wanna talk about a few of the things that we know about microgravity science that might drive how you conceptualize that future. Let's start with fire, because fire is always a fun place to start and, and rocket people love fire. If you look at the flame on the left, this is the classic flame that we've all grown up knowing here on earth. And a candle has this sort of tapered uh, almond shaped flame. And that's driven by combustion. When combustion happens, it makes hot gases. And those hot gases are less dense than the air around them. And so on Earth, they rise. And it pulls that flame up into its classic shape. Now, in space, when you're in free fall or microgravity, you don't get that differentiation. Lighter things aren't lighter in space. Heavier things don't sink. So instead of lighter gases pulling up the candle into a peak, Flames stay small and spherical. And that's really interesting, both because they burn cooler. You have a cooler flame and that's an interesting process, but also because they teach us a lot about the process of combustion. And we've been able to use insights gleaned on the International Space Station and other platforms to help us design more efficient engines, better understanding, better models of how that moment of ignition happens because that is exactly the same process that's happening in every engine on the ground. It just usually happens very fast and then gets pulled away by all those hot combustion products. So what do your candles look like on your table? If you had candles. Fluids are really, really fun in microgravity. Uh, I'm not sure how well the video will come through, but the image on the left is an Alka-Seltzer tablet, an, an antacid tablet being dropped into a bubble of water. And if you've never checked out the Saturday morning science videos on YouTube, uh, mostly by Don Pettit, they're fantastic. So here Don was playing with what happens as you start to create that effervescence, that fizz. And you see that bubbles don't do the same thing that we expect on Earth. They don't rise to the top, they don't layer. They just start to create this incredible surface tension. And you see that the, the, those layers are sort of all mixed up together. Interesting challenges if you're uh, trying to do research with fish in space, which has been done by a number of space agencies. How do you keep the air out of the water, out of the water tank for your fish? How do you think about what that might look like uh, for your dinner in space? On the right here, we see another video uh, by Don squeezing out of a, a drink bag, some drink into this really funny cup that he created. Now, this is actually the cover off of one of his protocol books. Uh, he's taken it and taped it into a teardrop shape. And at that bottom corner, you get an incredible amount of really cool effects from surface tension. They call this a critical wetting angle. And it means that fluids want to gather in that corner. Now, on the video on the left, we showed that you can't make air and fluid go where you want to go. And yet on the right, Don has used physics to make that work. And it's really interesting to think about why you might care about this. So it's really good if you're trying to drive propellants to a specific place in a tank, or if you wanna move liquids around for your life support system without having to have pumps. Now Don's drinking there out of a cup. That's a really funny thing. We usually think about drinking out of straws in space, but here's a cup that was designed based on the experiments that, that Dr. Pettit did. And here we see Samantha Cristoforetti from the Italian Space Agency enjoying the first espresso in the space station out of one of these cups. It's a very different experience when you get to smell what you're drinking, whether that's tea or coffee or anything else. 
So what does your drink look like in space? The last of the phenomenon I wanted to talk about is another talk about separation of density and buoyancy. Normally, if we take a material that is made of uh, immiscible fluids, fluids that don't mix, and we shake it up, we tend to see that they will separate back out into layers. In space, that doesn't happen. So whether you're making a salad dressing or you're, you're leaving your last seeds sitting for a long time in the fridge, uh, you're not gonna see that separation. There's nothing that's pulling them apart. Density doesn't have the same effect. And that's really fun for, for thinking about uh, fluids and, and food, but it's also really powerful when you think about manufacturing. So here you see a really interesting detail that was from a study that NASA did back in the early 80s, where they took a piece of glass and they pulled the first fiber optic cable in microgravity. They actually did that on one of those uh, parabolic airplanes we were talking about earlier. And it turns out that when you pull glass into fiber optics on the ground, that you tend to get little inclusions, little precipitates. The denser parts of that molten glass make crystals. When you do the same thing in microgravity, you don't get crystals. You get this really clean glass fiber. And it's from the same phenomenon that we're seeing on the left. You don't get density driving the phenomenon of your manufacturing. So suddenly you can make the best fiber optic cable, I'd say in the world, but off this world by doing it in space. So lots of really interesting things that drive us to think about science and our, our just sort of intuition of materials a little differently. Now food itself, the early days of the space program, you may be familiar with these tubes uh, the, the early Soviet astronauts and American astronauts all ate food out of squishy toothpaste-like tubes. Maybe not the most fine dining experience. But as we've moved through and matured how we send things to space and how we live and work in space, we've gotten to get a lot more creative. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, Paolo Nespoli uh, in the center there in, in the blue t-shirt uh, is another Italian astronaut. I think there's something about the Italians liking to have great food. Uh, and, and the espresso you saw earlier with, with uh, Samantha Cristoforetti. So when Paolo came up to the space station, they sent him the materials for making pizzas. These were essentially flatbreads uh, with tomato sauce and some simple ingredients. But it's a long, long cry from food in a tube. Uh, when Sunny Williams went up as a NASA astronaut, her family sent her samosas to enjoy uh, while she was there. So we get to think much more expansively about a future of dining in space. And then I like to just think about the mechanics. Here's a picture of, of a dinner at the International Space Station. It's very crowded, uh, first of all. I, I love the speed limit signs posted on the wall, 17,500 miles an hour, 28,000 kilometers per hour. That's how fast the space station is traveling around the earth. But you see that the astronauts have all gathered around the table no chairs. They don't need chairs to sit. They're just floating. Uh, there's some straps on the table that are holding down some of their ingredients so they don't float away. You'll, you'll, talk, you'll hear astronauts talk about uh, being very careful about where they place their fork. But you'll also hear them talk about coming back to Earth afterwards and dropping their fork in midair and realizing it will fall back to the ground uh, now that they're back in normal Earth gravity. So it's really fun to think about the, the things that we get used to as being normal. I like to think about a future where we can take those microgravity phenomena and make something really fantastic. Maybe it's a floating globule of drink. Maybe it's a decoration that you can only have in microgravity. Uh, the, the possibilities here are really endless and food is one of those things that brings cultures together, whether you are on earth or in space. So how are we getting there? We're not gonna make it all the way to the space station, but we are going to start to democratize the space uh, environment with vehicles like New Shepard. This is a, a rocket that I've been working uh, with for a number of years here at Blue Origin. It is really incredible uh, to not take your rocket and throw it away after a flight, but to now have reusable rocketry. Uh, that's both better for the environment, we're not throwing things away. It's a lot better for economics. If you imagine taking a flight uh, to maybe go see family in the times uh, after COVID, and then throwing away the airplane. Air travel would be prohibitively expensive. 
even if we drove to the city and threw away our car, we can't imagine what that, how much that would change our lives. So finally moving to an era where we can reuse these spacecraft is really changing the economics of space travel. And when I think about New Shepard, it's a suborbital vehicle. So it's basically doing one giant parabola, a lot like that airplane that we were talking about earlier. And that gives us up to the very edge of space and back. The Kármán line is at 100 kilometers. It's the internationally recognized boundary between Earth and space. Now, so far, less than 600 people have crossed that line and been to space. <clears throat> but if we think about the future, this is a vehicle that we would love to be flying every week. We would love to be opening up space travel, not just to national space agencies, but to communities and families and, and entrepreneurs and artists. When we're flying on New Shepard, we've had an opportunity to, to fly a lot of payloads, a lot of experiments to take advantage of that microgravity environment we were talking about earlier. Now, I'm not sure how well this video will come through, but this is a project from the Southwest Research Institute uh, down in, in Texas here in the US. And SWERI, uh, as they're known, is really interested in the planetary science domain. How do we think about going to other planets, uh, maybe asteroids? What do we do when we get there? How do we take advantage of those abundant resources in our solar system? So this device was actually designed to do uh, regolith dirt collection uh, at the surface of an asteroid. And it has small magnets inside. So it, it opens up, it lands on the surface of the asteroid. And asteroids have very, very low gravity. So we, they're more a loose, many of them are more a loose collection of rocks and dirt than a solid mass of metal. So if you were going to land on one of those rocky asteroids, how would you collect the material? And how would you bring it home? The researchers used a flight on New Shepard to start to simulate that and to test out this really ingenious mechanism they had created. I love one of the stories behind this too, because what they did in envisioning this was to look to nature. They thought about how a starfish feeds, and they actually call this the clockwork starfish, because a starfish feeds by taking its digestive system and pushing it outside of its uh, body and then pulling it back in. And here you see uh, a robotic starfish, a clockwork starfish, ingesting the regolith uh, around it. So that's our future that we're envisioning. It's the present that we are living in. We are opening those doors, not just for professionals, but also for students. We've had so many student experiments from all over the world. Now, your science fair is not just something that you do in your kitchen, but it's something you can do in space. We are really excited to have in our journey, whether it is uh, with New Shepard or our future uh, efforts going to the, the lunar surface, to be bringing the youth of the world along with us. And I hope some of you got a chance to see my colleague, Joseph Ranke, talk about the club for the future. And this is an initiative that we have to help inspire the future leaders in uh, science and technology and space. We have a great program that you can check out online on our website, clubforfuture.org. And one of the first things that we are doing is offering students all over the world a chance to send something to space with us. Uh, these are postcards that we have received from uh, literally all over the planet. We had tens of thousands of these on our last New Shepard launch. Uh, so I, I welcome you to think about this future that we talked about today, to draw it on a postcard and to send it to us at, at Blue Origin. Club for the Future will put those onto the New Shepard rocket. We will fly them to space, bring them back and mail them back to you all for the cost of postage. And I think it's really fun to think about an era where you know, when I was a kid, you didn't get to touch something that went to space. And now as y'all are growing up, you can think about a present where you can have on your, on your wall, something that you created that went to space and came back. So I'll, I'll just close with a, a quick short story. These are my two kids when they were much younger than they are now. But they grew up thinking about space as a place where they belonged. Um, and one of my favorite stories is, is, is they're you know, sort of thinking about what their future looks like. Uh, my little guy uh, up in the corner here came home from preschool one day and he was talking to my husband who works, uh, works on building airplanes. And he said, Daddy, when I grow up, I'm going to make airplanes, 
but Sally, she's going to make rockets because boys make airplanes and girls make rockets. And I think it's important because that's what they saw in their world. You know, that's what they saw as the possible for their future. And I can only imagine what happens as we raise a next generation that sees all sorts of possibilities and comes and joins us with a future of millions of people living and working in space. With that, I will stop the presentation uh, and turn to conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. That was very, very interesting. And thank you for including so many visuals. I think um, it made the talk even more interesting because we were able to see what you were talking about. And, uh, you know, I don't know about the rest of our attendees, but I certainly was very fascinated. So um, we have received a lot of questions for you. So uh, let's start right away. Um, the first question that we have here is, what is your opinion on uh, sustainable space exploration and green technology? So how do you think we're progressing around those lines? Yeah, it's a really important question, right? Especially if we're thinking about a future where the earth remains our primary home. And that, real, that really is what we are thinking about. There is no plan B for planet earth. We have to keep this planet uh, pristine. So we think about that a lot in, at Blue Origin. In, in fact, our company is named Blue Origin after our planet. This, you know, hundreds of years from now, when we are many places in the solar system, we will still look back at that, this blue planet and say, that is our origin. And so there are a variety of ways that you think about sustainability. Reusable rocketry is, is definitely an important one. Let's not throw away this, this uh, technology every time we fly. The New Shepard rocket is powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. When they come together, they just make water vapor. So that's actually not smoke coming out the back end of the rocket, it's steam. And that really is a much um, more environmentally friendly approach. And we think about it in how we build our facilities, how we clean our parts, how we uh, you know, treat our, our planet day to day. But I think we also, it, it's good to, to keep in mind that rockets are a very small part of, of pollution on this planet. Uh, and, and things like manufacturing and agriculture and, and uh, you know, many heavy industry and transportation uh, on the planet are, are a big part of the, the challenge that we're trying to solve. So if you look at the, the pollution created by airplanes, we would have to be flying rockets 40,000 times more than we are today to even equal the aviation industry. We're, we're a long way from being there. Very well put, though. I mean, I think, uh, like you rightly said, it's such an important thing to talk about. And as we progress ahead, uh, if you're actually talking about thinking of going to other planets, it only makes sense that we uh, take serious efforts to look into sustainability and, uh, you know, so on. So the next question that we have here for you is, what is your opinion on privatization of space? And are we actually looking at everybody going to space if things keep progressing the way they are? Yeah, so I hope everybody gets a chance to go to space. Uh, as I said, I don't think we should all be moving off the planet. I don't think that that makes sense. Um, but I think that everyone should have an opportunity there. Uh, so that, Commercialization uh, is a big piece of that story. I don't think we're all going to go on behalf of our nations. I think we're gonna go uh, on behalf of ourselves and of our communities and of humanity. So as we open those doors, it's a really interesting question of how do we bring down the cost of access yeah. so that more people can participate. Uh, and I think that, that 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 comes again, we talked about reusability, meaning that you don't throw away the system, means you don't pay for a new system every time, that helps as we start to fly more often, we get better at those operations. That brings down the costs and that helps. And then we have to be really intentional about thinking about how we expand access and things like Club for the Future are really designed to ensure that uh, space is a, a, a place for everybody uh, and that we, we, we really think about how do we uh, include the, the entire world in what we're doing. Very well said. Uh, Dr. Wagner, the next question that we have here is, what do you think about e-waste management in space? Because it seems to be on the rise. So how, how do we tackle the, uh, this problem? Was that waste management? Yeah, waste management. Yeah. So, so when, because space launch is still incredibly expensive, 
Yeah. Uh, it means that every pound we launch has a cost. And that depending on the, the ways that you launch, it's as much as $10,000 a pound to space. So that actually drives a really important discussion about reuse and recycling. Uh, some great work going on uh, on the International Space Station right now uh, to close those systems and make things more reusable. And you think about that in a number of ways. One is reclaiming water. And so the International Space Station has the most modern toilet in the world. Uh, it can recover, I think it's almost 90% of the water uh, back for the space environment. Uh, so as, as the astronauts like to joke, uh, you know, today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee. Um, but that, so that's, that's an important technology when uh, launching a new pound of water is expensive, but it's also something that can inform how we live and work on Earth. And so I'd love to see this, this uh, interchange between the technology of space and the technology of our, our own lives. There's also some really cool work going on. Uh, there's a company I'd encourage you to check out called Made in Space. that's doing the first 3D printing on the space station. And, and another company called Tethers Unlimited that has created a plastic recycler. So all the bags that things go up to the space station in can now be recycled into filament for 3D printers. So we start to see this nice closing of the ecosystem. Well, that's, that, those are some very beautiful examples that you put in there. I would definitely encourage all our attendees to go check out the companies that Dr. Wagner just mentioned. They are in your chat box. Just make sure that you go and have a look uh, at what these companies are doing because uh, clearly they seem to be doing something right. So, okay, so the next question that we have here is, um, I think something that you will relate with very closely. How do we make companies realize the importance of discussing space science in public discourses? Because obviously we don't hear as much as we should about space exploration because they are bound by so many policies in place and there's so much of um, privacy that comes into being. So uh, what is your personal take on that? I think there's a lot of great outreach going on. And I, I love that, that the, the festival reached out to, to us at Blue Origin and invited us to join this conversation. Uh, we have employees that are out talking to all sorts of, of groups and classrooms. Uh, and it happens from companies and it happens from individuals. And I would encourage uh, all my colleagues that are out there that, that may be into their careers already to think about how do we pay it forward, right? That, that we got here because people shared their, their visions and their experiences with us. So I take it as a personal responsibility and, and an exciting opportunity to share that with others. And I hope that others will too. I think uh, my key takeaway from your answer is uh, we got here because somebody else shared their insight, their knowledge with us, and it's only right that we continue to do so. So that was very well put. And I think it's really fun that we have with space in particular, there's also the opportunity just to, to dream about it, right? Yeah. And whether, whether it's Hollywood or Bollywood, people have been dreaming about space and sharing those visions for, for decades. Uh, I, I think that it's really exciting that, you know, I saw movies about space that really inspired me when I was younger. Uh, Apollo 13 was really formative for me in wanting to become an engineer uh, and, and to really see that possibility of problem solving, uh, not just being about the rocket, but being about the people inside. Uh, well, Dr. Wagner, the next question that we have here is, what do you think are the top three challenges that we need to overcome for the huge uh, supply uh, or chain demand of supporting civilization outside of, work, uh, outside of Earth? So what do you think are the three key obstacles in our way? Yeah, that's a fun question. There are so many obstacles. Space is hard. Um, the first one I'm gonna keep coming back to is cost. As long as space is really expensive, we won't go very often. And those who get to go will be a very narrow slice of, of our planet. Um, but that one's, that one's we're, we're working on that. Uh, I think politics is another, another interesting one. The, the early space races were driven by conflict between governments. I would love to see things like the International Space Station where the next generation was driven by collaboration between governments and that we think about ways of facilitating this and, and making it part of our, uh, our global discourse. Oh, wonderful. And for number three, you know, there's so many good technical challenges to solve. There's so many good technical challenges to solve. Uh, my background is actually in biomedical engineering as well as aerospace. Uh, and when we think about a future of living and working in space, 
radiation is a big challenge. How do, we, how do we keep our astronauts healthy uh, as we're living in an environment that's completely different than the one that we have evolved to, to be so well suited to here on earth? So radiation, bone loss, muscle loss are things that, that uh, physicians and physician researchers are really keen on, on working on right now. Uh, well, Dr. Wagner, the third obstacle that you mentioned, uh, you made it very easy for me to link into the next question that we have, because it's on the lines of astronauts. So we do know that uh, Blue Origin is uh, working on sending astronauts to space. So how has your personal interaction been working with astronauts? And could you tell what, tell us a little, give us a little sneak peek into the training that goes behind uh, uh, training astronauts in Blue Origin? Yeah, absolutely. So we have not gotten to our first human space flight yet. We are getting really close. Uh, the vehicle that will take our first astronauts to space just flew for the first time this month. Uh, I encourage you to check out our YouTube channel and, and watch that flight if you're excited about these things. And But we're thinking a lot about how do we change from astronauts that have trained for their careers to go to space to you and I coming down and training for a day or two to go to space. Now, these missions are much shorter. You're not responsible for flying our rocket. Uh, the, the training is, is a lot easier. We wanna make sure that you're going to be safe and that you're having fun. Uh, and so some of that is going to revolve around, uh, we call it microgravity etiquette. How do you avoid kicking your neighbor in the face when you're floating upside down? Some of it's going to be about just the safety systems in the vehicle, very similar to when you get on an airplane and they talk to you about the, the safety systems. Oh. You can imagine you need to know the same things when you're traveling on a rocket. And so we're going to prepare you to be, uh, be safe and have a whole lot of fun on these trips. Well, uh, Dr. Wagner, uh, I, can, I can say on behalf of many, many uh, students out there, like you rightly mentioned, at least at some point of time in everybody's life, we've thought of becoming astronauts. So uh, thank you for giving us uh, that uh, little sneak peek into um, Blue Origins training. So um, what do you think um, is the role of collaborations in space exploration? So we do know about various uh, space uh, agencies coming together and working together. So what is your take on that? Yeah, as I was saying before, I think as space becomes less parochial and more global, that that collaboration really is at the core of it. Uh, one of the things that I've loved about space, even from its earliest days, even when nations were fighting, scientists were collaborating. And I, I think that you know, science is one of those things that can transcend uh, you know, specific interests. And we can really come to say, what is this fascinating thing that we're studying? How do we do that together? Uh, and the International Space Station certainly is, is you know, premier in, in thinking about those kinds of international collaborations. Um, when we look at the corporate level, uh, there's, we can't do what we do without you know, our suppliers and our partners. This is something that, that does take a village, as they say, to, to make it successful. And so those, those uh, how do you build an ecosystem that works together well, uh, I think is really one of the things that is I, I hope every student will come out of school having done team projects, yeah, having had opportunities for collaboration, having gotten to build something with a group. Uh, the, those hands-on building experiences with a team are exactly the kinds of things we look for when we're hiring at Blue Origin, because that is the reality we live every day. So do all our attendees make sure you do attend uh, your uh, team uh, projects and make sure you make the best of them because they are going to be handy uh, as you progress ahead. So um, the next question is again, very interesting. What do you personally uh, think of space movies such as Interstellar? Uh, how close are they to reality and how important do you think they are in shaping our uh, imagination? I love space movies. I have loved space since I was a little girl and the movies and books have been a big piece of sparking my imagination uh, and, and thinking about what's possible through somebody else's eyes. Now, the physics in space movies, it depends. Some of them are really good. Some of them are really horrendous. Um, you know, Gravity is one of my favorite space movies for just being visually beautiful. Uh, but the orbital mechanics are lousy. Uh, so I, I think one of the, my favorites, uh, I'll go back to Apollo 13, uh, Tom Hanks and, and his crew, you know, 
reenacting the real life flight of Apollo 13, which had so many problems in flight. Uh, but one of the, the fun tidbits about that, in that movie is it was one of the first to actually film some of its scenes in microgravity. They actually filmed some of the scenes uh, on that parabolic aircraft that we were talking about. And so they got to experience weightlessness and, and it's not just special effects, but they're, they're, they're actually in free fall and, and dealing with those dynamics, which I think is really cool. Well, um, that was really insightful. Uh, Dr. Wagner, could you tell us a little about uh, the rocket uh, New Shepard that uh, Blue Origin has? I mean, a lot of our uh, attendees here know about the postcard program and we have told them about uh, the uh, functioning of the rocket, but it would be really great if you could tell us a little more about the actually engineering that goes behind into, make, into the making of the rocket and how it works. Hmm, cool question. So New Shepard is a suborbital rocket, right? It is uh, going up and coming back down uh, up to that Kármán line at 100 kilometers. Um, it is powered by a single engine, a BE-3 engine. And that's 110,000 pounds of thrust. Uh, again, we talked about it, it being powered by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen cryogenic temperatures in that fuel tank, in that propellant tank, uh, as they come together, getting really, really hot going out the, the rocket nozzle. So we have some really interesting challenges in material science for how you deal with extreme temperatures. Uh, we have some really exciting challenges in guidance, navigation, and control. So if you are a programmer out there, how do we take the data that we're giving? We're trying to balance you know, we, we have our, our rocket, we're trying to balance it on, on its rocket nozzle. If you've ever tried to balance a spoon, that's really hard to do. A broomstick is much easier. This isn't a huge rocket. It stands about mm, 20, 25 meters tall, about, about 70 feet. Uh, and it is always having to take that engine and move that engine around to keep itself balanced, particularly as it comes back down for a landing. So the modern, modern processor speeds, doing the math to, to do that balancing act, really exciting challenges uh, and, and interesting technical opportunities. And then the vehicle itself has really two main parts. We have the, the booster, the rocket itself, uh, and then we have the capsule that sits on top. As they go up, they have about two and a half minutes straight up into that Texas sky uh, with that 100,000 pounds of, of force pushing them up. And then the main engine cuts off and the crew capsule separates pretty gently with some springs, and then they're coasting. Right? And then you're unbuckling your seatbelt and floating, and you're doing your, your microgravity science. But that the systems continue to go up, right? They still have momentum, they're still traveling up and then coming down uh, from the Kármán line. And now we have to think about the descent stage. So we have the crew capsule, three parachutes, uh, they each have what's called a drogue chute, so a little tiny parachute that comes out first, stabilizes the vehicle, pulls out the main chute, and then those main chutes bloom like giant flowers in the, in the sky. Uh, as it comes down for a touchdown in the desert, uh, we have thrusters that, that kick up a lot of dust in the desert floor uh, as it makes a soft landing, so very much like a, an air pillow as it lands. The booster is going to come back down, yeah. and it's been traveling uh, with its engine turned off, so now as it comes down from about Mach 3.8, uh, you know, three, more than three times the speed of sound, it's going to come out. It has drag brakes that flare out. Now that makes the cross-sectional area of the rocket quite a bit bigger, slows it down. If you st ever stuck your hand out the window of a car, you felt that drag, right? So we're creating drag. So now we're going subsonic speeds below the speed of sound. Uh, we have some uh, fins that allow us to control the roll and, and, and yaw of the rocket. And then we'll relight that engine. Uh, and that's a really exciting maneuver to watch. If you see the videos, the rocket's really, you know, below 10,000 feet when, the, when that engine relights. It's a spectacular thing to watch it come out of the sky from space. And then suddenly you hear the sonic booms and you see the engine relight and it slows to a stop just before the pad. Uh, Dr. Wagner, that sounded like a story. You you narrated the entire thing uh, as if it were a story. That was so beautiful to just hear. I mean, I, it honestly didn't feel like a very uh, technical talk to me. That sounded really great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay, so the next question that we have here is, I mean, we have received so many questions and we're falling short of time. So we're just going to take two questions now. And that would be um, 
about it. So uh, the next question that we have here is, how successful have we been in simulating microgravity on Earth? Uh, this is a great question because there are ways to experience microgravity on Earth for very short durations. So if you go to your, your, uh, your nearest chair and you stand on top of the chair and you jump, you are weightless for a very, very short period of time. Uh, and there are, are places in the world where they have built very tall towers uh, so that they can drop things down the tower and get mm, five to 10 seconds of microgravity in the biggest ones. And so that gives you a, a very short exposure. Uh, if you want to simulate microgravity in some ways, you can also think about keeping things continuously in motion. And so biologists in particular love to do this. They have things called clinostats or random positioning machines where they're sort of taking the cell cultures and turning them so that the cells are always falling in the liquid that they're growing in. And that allows you to look at, at some pieces of, of how gravity works. If we're studying it in humans, uh, bed rest studies are actually very common. If you've ever had a, your, your arm or your leg in a cast, you know how much muscle you lose. Very similar, in fact, to, to being in space and not having to hold your body up. So these bed rest studies are a way that we mimic uh, the, the things like bone and muscle loss here on the ground. So lots of different ways of doing different pieces of it, but there is no room that you can go into and flip the switch and turn off gravity and float. I wish that there was, but you're gonna have to hop on an airplane or a rocket to do that. Um, Dr. Wagner, just give me one second because my uh, internet is just lagging for just a second. No worries. Just one second. And all right, uh, that, that looks slightly better now. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, the next question that we have for you here is uh, how, how far do you think we are from actually going and uh, staying and living in other planets? Or would you, would you be able to give us a rough estimate on the time uh, that we can look at? Yeah, so I think we will see commercial space travel is starting to happen now. So things like New Shepard are, are gearing up for first human flights and first commercial flights. And that, that is, to, you know, that's happening today. Uh, we see a lot of space agencies of the world gearing up to go to the moon. And I think the moon is just a few years away. Uh, and hopefully we're going in ways that are not just flags and footprints, but are sustainable communities. Uh, maybe looking a lot like a, a research base in Antarctica so that we start to see that kind of, uh, of community growing. Now, Mars is a lot harder to get to and a lot more expensive. I, I think it will probably be a while before we have a community living on Mars uh, and, and the other planets are even farther out and more expensive. So for me, I look a lot at what's happening uh, suborbitally in low Earth orbit and the moon is our, our real near-term opportunities and absolutely in my lifetime. And I, I really hope that you guys get a chance to go in yours. Thank you so much. That was definitely a, a very motivational uh, bit to end on. Um, now, before uh, we end the session, I'd just like to take your final thoughts and uh, like to ask you something that we ask all our uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Bagno, what role do you think public engagement platforms like India Science Festival play in order to bring science closer to society? How important do you think uh, platforms like these are? Oh, so critical, right? I, I think, oh, I'm hoping that my internet is coming through. Um, the engagement between scientists and engineers and the rest of the public is what gives us the power to dream. It's what gives us permission to, to think about a future that we take part in. Uh, and not just something that happens in, in some laboratory somewhere, but something that happens is, as part of, of our vision of our future. And I think that that's, that's absolutely critical to, to building up uh, the momentum, the passion, and the capabilities of the next generation. So thank you so much to everyone who, who joined us today for this conversation. Uh, do keep thinking about your own dinner in space and the ways in which you want to make this happen. And, and know that it's not only careers in science and technology, but business and law and uh, arts and everything else that has to come together for these futures to become real. 
Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Wagner, I think that was a very key, uh, a very good point to end on that it's not just science and tech, it's also a lot of other things that are involved. So, uh, you know, everybody should really think in terms of, um, I- I'm definitely going to think about dinner in space. <laughs> it's a good thought to uh, leave everybody with. But um, and thank you so much for joining us. It was such a pleasure listening to you. And thank you for patiently list, uh, you know, answering all the questions that were posed by our attendees. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, we have uh, ended the talk on living and working in space. And that was definitely very, very interesting. Um, A lot of uh, important points to think about. And, um, you know, with that, we are now going to progress into another very interesting discussion that a lot of our attendees have been waiting for. So we talked about... um, space science here, but a key point that Dr. Wagner mentioned was about uh, how we perceive space science in different uh, uh, media. Yeah, so um, the next discussion that we have is something that a lot of you have been looking forward to, and it's all about the interplay of space science and science fiction. And on that note, I'd like to request um, our panelists Uh, Professor Vandana Singh and Professor Mark McCorian to kindly turn their audio and video on. And may I request Promit, our moderator for today, to join the discussion. Thank you so much for joining us, Promit. I will now um, hand over the mic to you. And uh, please do introduce the panelists to our audience members. We'll be taking questions in the end. Over to you. Hi everyone. So uh, thank you, Shruti, for the wonderful session with uh, Dr. Wagner. I think that leads uh, pretty well into our current session. So uh, a very good evening. I think it's afternoon or morning uh, from where you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, to Professor Mark McCorian and uh, Professor Vandana Singh. So I'll just do a little intro for both of you uh, that I've collected, and then uh, we can move on with the conversation. Sure. So, uh, Professor Makorian, a Senior Advisor for Science and Exploration at the European Space Agency, uh, co-founder of Space Rocks. So, uh, sir, could you tell us a little bit more about Space Rocks? It sounds really interesting. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you. Um, Thank you for the invitation to come on this afternoon. Uh, I'm speaking from the Netherlands, where it is indeed uh, the afternoon. Um, So, yeah, I work for the European Space Agency. And, you know, obviously, we have to talk about all of the missions that we fly uh, to explore the universe, to go to the nearest planets, um, to do Earth observation and look down at planet Earth as well. Um, And there's a big responsibility for us for outreach. So how do we bring that to the general public? And one of the ways we do that, out of many, is this thing called Space Rocks, where we bring together scientists, engineers, astronauts, with musicians, writers, filmmakers, um, thinkers, cultural people um, who can bring us uh, a different perspective on the sorts of things we're doing um, and vice versa, that we can, you know, engage them in the sort of work that we're um, doing in the European Space Agency. And those are live events where we bring the public uh, to listen to speakers and to hear bands playing and to watch films. In the last year, of course, that's been uh, all done online. So we have a weekly chat where we talk to people from all of those fields, um, engineers, scientists, musicians, writers, filmmakers, actors. Uh, called Uplink. Uh, we've been doing that for a year now. So yeah, it's been fantastic working with people from across um, the broader cultural domain for interesting discussions. And I hope we'll have some of that this afternoon as well. Yeah, uh, I think uh, this is right up the alley of, uh, I mean, science communication in general. And uh, uh, so I would like to ask uh, Professor Vandana Singh a few questions. Uh, it says, so from your own bio, from your own website, I picked up this which sounded very interesting a writer of speculative fiction and not just science fiction uh, so could you explain what you mean by uh, speculative fiction um well <laughs> that's a good question i hope you can hear me all right 
Yeah. Um, okay. Well, uh, there are actually many definitions of speculative fiction, but uh, my definition essentially is that it's a broad umbre umbrella-like term that encompasses science fiction, fantasy, magic realism, you know, various other kinds of imaginative literature. Lovely. And I think uh, one of your works is uh, quite curiously named Ambiguity Machines uh, and Other Stories. So is this a reference to quantum computers in some way? Or, uh... <laughs> no, no, not at all. Uh, it's, well, uh, it's hard to describe, but uh, that's okay. definitely in the arena of more speculative uh, fiction that's kind of, uh, I would say, a blend of science fiction and fantasy. So that, that particular short story is uh, up on the internet, and uh, but uh, it's also the it also titles my book of short stories, which is uh, I don't have in front of me right now the edition that's available in India from Zuban Books, but it's there, same name. Okay. So uh, very warm welcome to both of you, and uh, I think uh, so. I was thinking like we since. Um, I mean, both of you are scientists by profession, uh, but one of you has, I mean, both of you have sort of chosen science communication as something that you want to be heavily involved with. So I would like to ask, uh, open the discussion by asking you, what kind of an exchange do you see between science and science fiction? How do they inform each other, influence each other? Um, so either of you, uh, if you would like to answer that question. So, when so you uh, have, yeah, Professor Singh. Yeah. Do you want me to go ahead? Okay, I can start. Uh, well, it's a, that that relationship has a long history, um, mm -hmm. and I think for me, uh, in particular, uh, not being a scholar of science fiction studies, but being uh, perpetrator of science fiction, that uh, that uh, the relationship to me, one of the key things about it is that uh, both things, uh, science, particularly space science and science fiction, have in common a sense of wonder about the universe in which we find ourselves. And, uh, uh, you know, realist fiction is just so blind to the rest of the, to the non-human universe whether it's uh, other non-human species on the planet or the possibility of aliens on other worlds, uh, but also to the physical universe. And, uh, you know, and I think science fiction does this beautiful job of, of really asking our relationship with the cosmos as a whole, which was a role that, you know, perhaps ancient epics played once, but we don't have any other uh, equivalent of it uh, than science fiction in modernity. So I think it helps us on, uh, relate the human to the cosmological. And uh, it does that very well through evoking this common sense of wonder that we share with science. Um, and it allows, uh, you know, to some extent, it allows a certain, uh, you know, anticipatory uh, imagination to develop. So there are a few examples, for instance, uh, Arthur C. Clarke famously came up with the idea of geostationary satellites well before uh, you know, such things came into being. And yet we take them for granted today. But the idea behind science fiction isn't really prediction. And in fact, the future is often used as a metaphor to describe aspects of our current present situation, perhaps exaggerate one aspect of it and say, what if human beings were like this? Or what if our relationship with the cosmos or with technology was like that? Um, so that's one of the things that science fiction does. And then lastly, the other thing that uh, science fiction can do, and this relates to what, uh, what Mark was saying about, uh, about you know, uh, gathering people, uh, including artists and musicians, uh, into the fold of scientific discovery, uh, because one of the things that the canvas of science fiction does is to allow us to explore ethical questions and ask deep philosophical questions that might yet inform, and at least that's my hope, um, how we go into space, what we do when we get there, and all of those sort of things. That's a very interesting point. Uh, so, Professor McCorian, like, uh, how would you describe the influence that your interaction with artists and musicians have had um, through this experience of, uh, I mean, space rocks? Mm. Well, so how I does that inform your... 
Yeah, if, if, I, if I just go, you know, sort of back to the, the beginning when I was a kid, right? I mean, so when this film in the background here, this is 2001 A Space Odyssey, this is oh, yeah. Space Station 5, which of course gives the the implication that there are actually four other ones at least. So it's not the only space station in space. Today we have one, effectively one international space station. <clears throat> it's not a big centrifuge like this. Uh, so the astronauts are, are floating in microgravity as opposed to being able to walk around in 1G. Um, but, you know, we're there. OK. And it's been in orbit for 20 years. So almost in a sense, 2001, 2021, if you do the maths, the, the International Space Station was around when this was there. And of, of course, there's some prosaic things in that film to do with going to the moon, um, digging holes in the moon, discovering things on a journey to Jupiter. And we've been to Jupiter and the European Space Agency is sending a new mission back to Jupiter in the ne in a next couple of years. So many of those things are parallel. But then there's that broader philosophical question, of course, about are we alone in the universe? Um, what would our interaction be if we did encounter aliens? And of course, in the film, very cleverly, you actually don't encounter aliens. You, this was something that was removed in very early stages. They they w tried to work on it, and C Stanley Kubrick sort of figured it, it's too ridiculous, right? People are going to focus on what these aliens look like, not what they bring in philosophical terms, where we have stepped over some boundary. We are sort of now, you know, the, the initial monolith is about um, some kind of seeding of intelligence or encouragement of intelligence and now when we've got to the moon and discovered the other monolith we sent a signal out that we're ready to be admitted into some kind of galactic club now in ESA we don't do any of that you know that's not that's not in our remit you know to join the galactic club we are looking for life elsewhere in the universe and we're looking we've found planets around other stars so there are aspects which are true um but as Vandana said, you know, at some point, these questions become very critical. What are the ethical dimensions? What are the philosophical dimensions? Um, you, things like going to the moon and going to particularly going to Mars, where there might be life already. What is the ethical dilemma that we that we have where, you know, if we go to the planet and we bring our life and our life forms, we risk, a, you know, a kind of a genocide. Perhaps we may wipe out life that exists there already. Um, and how do we do that? Should we go? Should we leave it as a park and let it be? Uh, of course, we're trying to discover whether that life is there or not. But almost by doing the experiment, there's always a risk that we contaminate the planet. And I think we need to engage the public and um, philosophers and writers and thinkers much more than or just as much as scientists, because scientists quite often or engineers, as you know, I, I am a scientist, but some of us can be very literal minded and say, well, who cares? You know, let's just go and do it. It's like, well, it's a bigger question than that. And so, so through Space Rocks and other things that we do in outreach, we try to engage those that because we are making decisions effectively on behalf of the whole of humankind and in some sense, other species that we don't even know the names of yet. So that can't just be the scientists and the engineers making those decisions. Yeah. That's a very thoughtful uh, thing to think about. Like, how do you inform the ethics of science through sci-fi? Um, so it does provide like a basis for imagination. Um, but uh, in in I I feel that in most like si most science fiction films or books that I've read, the the aspect of them that I have found most interesting is the reflection of the technology on society at large, as in um, things like uh, a recent series called The Expanse, which explores this space setting civilization of ours uh, sometime in the remote future. Uh, they have created this sort of class hierarchy based on people who are born in outer space and thus have lower bone density and things like that. So, I mean, as a science fiction author you have to build this entire universe uh how how do you how do you think about the uh the interlinking of these different aspects when you're building this universe uh, professor singh um well that's one of the joys of uh, of the creative enterprise um you know and because um it's not just creating future technologies and future and and 
speculating on, um, on science as we know it and science as we don't know it, which is a ton of fun uh, to do, but also you have to create cultures and you have to create believable cultures. Uh, so if you look at classic science fiction in the West, um, you know, um, especially in, in North America, um, it, it reads very dated in part because uh, they forget to change cultures and to recognize that one, cultures are different on earth and two, they're always in change in, in uh, you know, from one form to another. And so, you know, you'll have uh, uh, stories that are set in some remote future um, and I'm thinking of Isaac Asimov and other classic writers here, where you know the the women, for instance, will be doing things like cooking dinner for their husbands and playing a 1950s gender stereotype role, you know, and and one would hope that any kind of positive future would have a more egalitarian relationship uh, between uh, the genders. Um, so, so when we build worlds we really have to think about alternatives to our current social uh, arrangements as well. And uh, sometimes that involves coming up with entire inventions of religions and mythologies and you know, belief systems and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, uh, and in fact, Asimov himself, who has a wide variety of stories, has a beautiful classic story called Nightfall, uh, which actually illustrates my point very well. Um, where the story is really about how the paradigm in which this civilization has come up on this planet is completely shattered by an astronomical event and how the people react to that. So uh, building, building alternate societies, building paradigms, as well as uh, you know, not, not limited to the scientific technological, I think that's a large part of what science fiction can do. And uh, one of the in interesting things that has happened in science fiction, particularly in the 70s, when women writers in North America, particularly and in Western Europe, started to kind of take it back and complicate it and make it more interesting and make it more literary uh, so that character development and uh, the development of different kinds of cultures, the anthropological element becomes more uh, important than it ever was before. And now we have a very interesting uh, state of international science fiction, where finally science fiction writers from far flung corners of the globe, uh, whether it's India or Argentina or Italy or uh, you know Nigeria, are talking to each other, and in a sense, um, you know, taking science fiction away from its roots. Because uh, much as I love both science and science fiction, I have to be honest and admit that they both have their roots in colonialism. And when you bring in people from different backgrounds, cultures, and so on, then it inevitably enriches the field, whether we're talking about science or science fiction. So uh, I hope I've answered your question, or at least yeah. begun to answer it. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if I wonder, if, I mean, I wonder yeah. if I if I can pick up because that you know definitely a couple of topics which are high on my mind. Firstly, you mentioned the expanse, and you said it's in the distant or the remote future. I don't think it is. I think it's today. I think the important point is, um, you know, okay, the setting may be hundreds of years in the future, but the questions which are being asked are right now and here today, because they are precisely about how what kind of interplay will there be between civil systems and private uh, wealth and private and capitalism when it expands into space and these are exactly the questions being asked by companies like uh, Amazon like uh, SpaceX and others you know what is the model under which we want to proceed into space and frankly it looks an awful like sort of fantasy colonialism of uh, of the 1950s. I mean, the, the, I'm afraid that the boys who are running those companies haven't, ob to me, obviously haven't read anything other than Asimov. Uh, they haven't grown up with science fiction at all. I mean, one of the great ironies about The Expanse, well, I mean, you know, we, we've had two of the actors from The Expanse feature in, in Space Rocks. So uh, we've had Dominique Tipper, who's Naomi Nagata, and uh, Shore Agdeshlu, who's uh, um, Ava Sarala, the, you know, head of the United Nations. And, and We've had very interesting discussions with them because what the irony was that the show was cancelled 
uh, at the end of the third season, um, and it was rescued by Amazon by Jeff Bezos, who said it was his favourite science fiction film, and I, and I just or, or series, and I wonder whether he even watched it because it's so openly critical of the model of capitalism and the hierarchy of the Belters and the Martians and, and the Earth people, and this idea of some kind of mysterious person trying to use the proto molecule to get a, a commercial advantage. It, it, it is Jeff Bezos. I mean, I don't understand what, you know, anyway. So, um, and, and the flip side of what Vandana said there, I think is absolutely vital that we've seen a, 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 an increase in both in viewpoints, culturally, gender wise, broadly diversity wise. And the one country you didn't mention, which has been fascinating to me in the last few years is Chinese science fiction because I mean, particularly famously the, the three body problem by Liu Qijin, um, in which from the first page, you're exposed to a world and a culture, which is the cultural revolution and the basis for the whole book, which it's not alien to people who live in the West, but we, you know, it, it, it opens up a door to the, the, the changes in Chinese culture on a timescale of one generation, not 10 generations, have been astonishingly large. And, it, and it's fascinating because the book takes a very different perspective on what it is to be human than classical Western sci-fi where pretty much everybody you know you're either a bad person or a good person there are no good people or bad people in that book you know there's people very fallible people who make bad decisions and good decisions and you know and, and Chinese science fiction opens up a new avenue for us to consider the future because let's be to be honest you know I mean, this may be sound openly critical but the future is not American the future is Chinese, it's Indian, it's the world, and we need to stop thinking about classical manifest destiny science fiction and try to change our viewpoint because that's going to be the practical reality. The American empire, and I, you know, I may be criticized for this, the American empire is in decline. It's had its time. It is now the time of new empires, and they are the ones in the end, I'm afraid, or not afraid, just I think it's true, uh, we need to start thinking about that in a much, much broader uh, uh, palette of, of cultural understanding. So, so uh, do you think the science fiction that belongs to a particular language or nation um, sort of reflects their view of science as a means to control versus a means to understanding? Or, I mean, can you, is that discernible from European, American or Chinese science fiction? Do you feel that? Well, um, let, me just pick, uh, let me just pick up quickly on that. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, a science fiction writer, um, but, you know, one, the other kind of science fiction we haven't discussed is, is Russian science fiction and this whole entanglement with cosmism, this, you know, very much more spiritual approach to space exploration, which if you look, and I, I have a book here somewhere of uh, imagery from the early um, space program in, in the Soviet Union, is a very different set of philosophical and cultural imagery to that used in the American context, where there were flags everywhere and heroes. Now, there were heroes in the Russian imagery, but it was very different. It was very much more philosophical. Um, so absolutely, I, I, I think, and I also realize that when I read Chi Chinese science fiction, I'm reading in translation, and I'm not even sure that I'm necessarily catching all the nuances. Uh, and that may well be true, that a lot of stuff is kind of hidden almost in subtext in books. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I only ever read science fiction in English, so it's hard for me to uh, to know. Yeah, well, um, I think I think these are absolutely fascinating and uh, uh, emphatic yes to everything you said, Mark, <laughs> uh, because uh, I really think that this is an exciting time for us to think about space exploration differently. And yet the people who are leading the current new space race, like you said, uh, people like Jeff, Bezos, Elon Musk and all, um, are really going with that old colonialist mindset. Uh, there's a friend of mine working on a PhD in, in space law and policy who points to that, um, that if you look at the language that they use, then it's filled with this colonialist imagery. And in fact, I was once at an ISS R&D conference where Elon Musk uh, spoke about the need to go to Mars and so on and so forth. But uh, what he said was, we need to sell this idea to the public by making Westerns on Mars. And I mean, some of us just looked at each other and cringed. And, uh, and so, you know, to add to your, uh, your beautiful elucidation of what uh, Chinese and Russian science fiction have to give us, 
there's also this emerging notion of uh, indigenous science fiction, indigenous futurisms uh, that completely, you know, catch that whole colonialist impulse so well. So, uh, so for instance, there's a collection of, uh, there's an anthology of short stories by the indigenous academic Grace Dillon, which uh, has collections by Native American writers on their takes, their various perspectives on uh, science, science fiction, space exploration, and so on. And I think we have a lot to learn from them because what uh, we can do with space exploration, um, if we were wise enough to do it, is to actually do it right and not do it from some kind of a hegemony type impulse, you know, whether it's, it's uh, American hegemony or Chinese hegemony or whatever. I mean, if we can find some way to think about humankind and not just humankind, but earthlings um, kind of extending their biophilia, their, their uh, uh, you know, appreciation for life and for wonder and for exploration into, into space uh, and ask ourselves, why are we going to space? Um, is it to make a few people even richer than they are now? Or is it for some other reason? And if it's for other reasons, if it's for humanity, if it's for Earth, then why is it that other people don't have a say in this? Why is it that we have a bunch of tech billionaires leading the space race? And who appointed them representatives of humanity? Uh, so there's a profound, uh, you know, tragedy for me that if, if we don't allow other people to have their say, then we risk repeating the horrors of colonialism. Um, and uh, whether it, you know, if we go to the moon or to Mars, uh, it can exhibit in more than one way. Even if we go to a lifeless world where there's no, perhaps no danger of destroying, uh, you know, other life forms. And the questions we ask uh, and the way we think about it can still be profoundly colonialist. Uh, consider for instance, the in the US, the, the Space Act of 2015, which allows commercial entities to mine the moon. Um, and I'm not a legal scholar by any means, but I know that this has set off um, some uh, reverberations in the space uh, law community, because it may be in violation of the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, which basically says no nation can own any part of space, any celestial body. So, uh, but can we allow commercial entities to own the moon? or to mine on the moon and make profit from those things? Uh, and what does it mean to allow them access to low earth orbit? Uh, does that mean that uh, you know, they, have, they can also uh, attain military power? Uh, they're all those things to think about too. And then consider the fact that modern civilization hasn't solved the problem of waste, right? Waste is a huge problem. Whether you're talking about you know, the detritus of civilization or whether you're talking about things like carbon dioxide pollution in the atmosphere, which is uh, you know, threatening our survival and that of the biosphere. Uh, well, in low Earth orbit, there are, I think, I believe, at least 500,000 pieces of junk that are being tracked by NASA. Some of them as tiny as paint flecks, which, because they're traveling at such high speeds, uh, are really a threat to satellites and to any other uh, objects that we put out there. So it seems as though we are carrying our problems with us into space without thinking deeply about what they are and how to solve them. And I think that's, that's uh, with due apology to adolescents, that's not grown up behavior. <laughs> so <laughs> to echo what you said, Mark, yeah. it's time we grew up. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I this was, is a, sorry, please go no, on. I was just, I'm just gonna pick up on the space debris issue because of course, you know, we, 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 we see, we almost become so routine now that we almost ignore them, but Every few weeks, uh, SpaceX is launching another 60, 70 satellites into low Earth orbit. And there's this completely confused sort of philosophy about it. These uh, low Earth orbit satellites are to provide high speed Internet for the world. And it's always sold again on that colonial perspective that you might have it where you live in your city, but there are people in Africa that don't have it. So here we are going to be benevolent and give it away. Well, we're not going to give it away for free, of course. We're going to monopolize it and we're going to sell it to you and we're going to take away any local control that you might have over the internet, whether that's political, which of course is, you know, uh, the access to information in China, for example, is not the same as it is in the West, but it also takes away the possibility of building a local infrastructure uh, and, and local control in an economic sense. It just siphons the money and takes it away. But then you realize, you know, so firstly that takes away then access to the night sky, whether it's for exploration or Earth observation, we have to move our satellites constantly to get out of the way of these things now because there's so many of them. 
Um, they create the possibility of debris and more debris and junk, which might kill off all of the useful satellites, let's say. Um, there's been this big issue about it also taking away access to the night sky, something, you know, you just look at the sky and where you might see fixed stars and inspire children, you might now see thousands of satellites which are bright points moving around and it, and it removes away a public heritage, if you like, a worldwide one. And now what's become bizarre about this is, of course, you now see Europe and other countries responding. So we can't allow strategic control of something like worldwide internet to belong in American hands or Chinese hands or Russian hands or wherever. So Europe says we now must build a satellite constellation the same. But of course, it's it's not locally concentrated. It just it pollutes everybody's sky because they have to fly around the Earth. So even if it's only meant for Europe, everybody has to suffer the consequences. And then the philosophical bizarreness of this is that it's supposed to then bootstrap a Mars colonization program, and I use the word because that's what they use, in order to save humankind from a planet, this one, the one we live on, which is becoming polluted by CO2. It's, you know, who's even if you send a million people to Mars, that's a tiny fraction. It's one in a thousand. That means that you and I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe I know a thousand people. I know one person that's going, right? Um, that's one in 10,000. It's even worse um, if there's 10 billion people on the Earth. So l largely, you're, you're saying, I, I've given up on this planet, and I'm going to send people to that one, uh, Mars, which is frankly utterly inhospitable. Everything we know about it says it's an absolutely miserable place to live. Nobody will enjoy living on Mars. Uh, if they can survive at all. And yet, you know, so this whole idea, this sort of colonialism of we want to give access to the internet, make loads of money, and then save humankind by taking some rich people off to Mars, um, and you're not going, by the way, and you're just going to have to suffer on the Earth that we've destroyed through the same model. It, 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 it beggars belief that this is something which a lot of people support, frankly. I mean, they ought to start reflecting on, on the, the system that we live in in the world and, and how it is that how we even get to pick where people can individuals single people have enough money that they can run space programs that rival the united states or europe or the so or russia i mean how is that even possible but that's politics that's not really science fiction but science fiction and allows us through the expanse and other and written science fiction allows us to explore the consequences of actions we are taking today so we really do need more people to you know, watch the outcomes and science fiction writers provide that avenue for saying, this is what's going to happen to you. How do you think this can play back? As in, uh, through space exploration, uh, we find more efficient ways of sustaining, uh, sustaining ourselves and our society. Uh, like, it was, like Professor Wagner mentioned in the previous talk, how systems become more efficient, the way you recycle water and become more circular in the production process and processing. Uh, so how do you think that can help inform life on Earth and thereby like eliminating the need for colonizing as, as they say? Uh, or, or Because the argument that they provide is that the, the prospect of colonization of, a, of another planet is what generates that interest, that enthusiasm in society, uh, which which pushes these uh, programs forward. Uh, but what are your views on that? I mean, is, is there any other way in which we can uh, get people excited about uh, space programs or space, uh, space exploration? I, I leave that to Vandana first. I, you know, I just had a little rant, so I'll... Uh, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there's so many better ways of exciting people about space. Um, especially if, and you know, I like the example you give, and I've spoken to astronauts who have, uh, you know, who been on the ISS, and uh, and that's one of the things that they say. And in fact, uh, one of the Apollo missions, the one that, um, I forget which number mission it was, but the one that orbited the moon and didn't land on it and took the first picture of Earth from space, um, they, right. uh, all of these uh, you know, we, we get this notion that when we get away from Earth and we look back on it, we suddenly realize that it's the most important place in the universe, right? Um, and so much as it's so, uh, it's it's cool to go to other planets and explore them. And, you know, uh, in science fiction, like, you know, being a science fiction writer, I love exploring those possibilities and imagining different scenarios and, 
you know, I remember doing a lot of research and really enjoying writing a story about life on one of those uh, those planets that's tidily locked to its star and, you know, imagining life in the Terminator zone and so on and so forth. So all that is wonderful, I think. And uh, it's not necessarily, I don't know that people are necessarily excited about living on other planets unless they've been massively misled by 50s era science fiction, which paints a much a more romantic image of those sort of things than it's possible. I mean, what we forget is our own relationship to the rest of um, the species on our planet is deeply broken and we don't appreciate that. And imagine like if, if we were to be plucked from here and taken to Mars, you know, for maybe of some time you would be, oh, wow, look at this, it's so cool. But the fact is that we've evolved with or other organisms around us, you know, the tree outside my window, the bird that's singing despite the cold and all of that. And the, the, that means something to us. So one of the things that I think the first space missions did was to uh, have us recognize the beauty and uniqueness of our own planet. And that's partly why uh, I know NASA and ESA have a lot of missions that look back at the Earth and study Earth, including climatic uh, effects and so on. Um, but I do like this notion of uh, how, you know, when, you, when you're in a orbiting satellite, you, you cannot afford to uh, junk up the place. You have to think in a circular way. And that is a lesson for our planet. And it's a lesson that uh, we had and many uh, indigenous communities, for instance, still have that, uh, uh, you know, that we are an island. We are, the earth is an island. It's, uh, the earth is a satellite swimming through space. And, and we simply can't foul it up. Um, that would not only be a terrible thing to do, but it's a profoundly stupid thing to do to our only home. Um, so, so I think that that notion of, the, of uh, that lesson of circularity and the lesson of respecting every resource you have so that you don't waste it is something that we've forgotten. And, and, if, uh, and space, you know, a space philosophy that rests on the wisest foundations can indeed uh, help inform life on Earth and how we go forward. Uh, but a space philosophy that's like cowboys in space <laughs> is not going to do it. <laughs> Look, I, I, I completely agree. And I think, you know, that idea of reflecting uh, on our position in the universe is perhaps the greatest gift that space exploration can bring. If it doesn't inspire a degree of humility and a degree of insignificance, but also marvel at the fact that we have evolved to a point where we can comprehend the universe in, in some sense, that we can use telescopes, we can use probes, we can go to places with machinery or with photons, uh, that we can understand the enormous scale of the universe, the enormous inhospi inhospitability of the universe, the fact that it isn't welcoming for us, and yet within that there is an oasis which is perfectly tuned to us because we evolved within it. And uh, as Vandana said, the idea that we would pollute that and use all the resources and destroy them, I mean, if your if you're, if you're, uh, resulting decision is, well, we've messed this one up, let's go somewhere else and do it again, you've got exactly the wrong uh, end of the stick from what we are learning about the universe that this is a place which is perfectly tuned to us if only we would respect it better and so we do we look at that with our missions from above we try to help understand the processes and the uh, the, the the ways in which we're damaging the earth and hopefully learn how to stop doing that but for me in the in the space exploration domain it's about bringing perspective it's about saying look, we are able, we are capable. It's, it's awesome that we, as a piece of the universe, have evolved to the point where we can understand much of it. But the lesson we should learn from that is that, you know, we are not very well suited to going and living around the edge of a black hole, let alone go through the event horizon and go into a library, which, I mean, what is that in Interstellar? I mean, it's all very nice, but, you know, really. Um, now, uh, let me just you know sort of pause with an example um a few years ago many of you will remember that we had a mission called rosetta which was european space agency's mission to comet 67p churum off gerasimenko it was a long journey 
Uh, there were you know, flybys at Earth and Mars and asteroids. It was, you know, it was a kind of a cool journey. And we had two spacecraft, Rosetta and Philae. And we did lots of things to publicize that in ESA um, with cartoons and all sorts of technical information. But one thing that we did do was make a science fiction film. We made a short film called Ambition, so it's seven minutes long, in which we look back on Rosetta from the deep future. Who knows when? You know, and it's really magical realism as much as it is anything else, but it's somewhere a million years in the future. Are these people even human? We don't know. They look like humans, but are they? Um, and they're talking about the point of the mission. And the point of the mission was, as we focused in, uh, was to find out how the water arrived on Earth. Where did water come from? It wasn't here when the Earth was hot. Was it delivered afterwards? Or did it come out of the rocks, you know, from underground? Um, and we tried to set the scene also with humility, because in the film we don't show the landing on the comet. Uh, because that happened, the film was released before we actually even tried. And so we didn't sort of do the gung-ho thing. Of course it's going to work, so let's show the landing. No. But we chose to look back. And, and it, there's even a moment where one of the characters in the film says, yeah, well, I know all about that mission. There were bigger ones later. There were better ones. Why are we talking about this one? So we kind of tried to set it in perspective as well. But it was from that philosophical perspective. What can space exploration tell us about our own origins? And by learning about our own origins and our own fragility and the, the fragility of the biosphere that we have, we should be humble, not emboldened to start marching off across the universe and plant flags. A, because it's not the right lesson and B, because it's an awful lot harder than people think um, or want to think. And I think that's the critical thing. People want to think it's easy and we've been encouraged partly through science fiction. Science fiction is partly responsible for that image that, well, we just strap on strap into our seat and we go and we'll be at a black hole and we'll go through it um you know it makes for nice stories but it doesn't make for good science and it doesn't make for good philosophy either i don't think yeah i think that's a very good point as to where to draw the line to not get carried away um <laughs> okay so i'll i'd like to focus on uh, professor singh's work with meti meti uh, that's messaging extraterrestrial intelligence and in this context, I would remember the movie Arrival, where they spoke, I mean, they described this language, this alien language, which is made of circular scripts and allows you, if you learn the language, it allows you a different perception of time itself, uh, which was, I thought, was the point of the movie. But how, in, in that kind of a context where a language could change your perception of time itself, uh, an alien language, how do you approach the problem of messaging and extraterrestrial intelligence? Well, uh, first I should mention that I'm only on the advisory council of METI, so and only and that too only recently, and I've attended exactly one meeting, so I can't speak for the organization. But what I can say that it's it's trying to kind of complement the SETI program, which is where you look for signals of. Uh, potentially intelligent civilizations from um, space, uh, where you, uh, and in METI, you actually try to consider the problem of sending signals. In fact, people have sent messages, uh, um, I think since about the mid 1970s. Um, and I think, I think it's really interesting because uh, again, uh, it illustrates the entanglement between what we do on earth and what, what plays out in space. Uh, because in, in order to understand how to communicate with uh, an alien civilization, uh, we have to think about how we communicate among human cultures as well, because there are so many things that are not universal in human cultures as well. And, you know, we have so many stories of cultural misunderstandings and clashes of paradigms and worldviews. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing that can help us, of course, is communication with non-human species. And now that uh, we are getting more and more decentered from the human, and recognizing that they're intelligences of different kinds and that other animals have uh, communication systems, for instance, dolphins and whales, but also uh, more recently, prairie dogs, uh, hum so-called humbler species, and also gibbons. So when we try to communicate with other species, uh, what are the barriers in the way? What are the possibilities of misunderstanding? And that kind of can train us to think about, um, about how we might communicate with aliens. I really like the film Arrival and even more so the story behind it, which is by Ted Chiang. It's called Story of Your Life. 
and it it actually starts uh, in reverse chronological idea because of, uh, in, in chronological uh, sequence because it it really is a story about time and how we conceive time and uh, one way we can think about it is that different cultures on our planet have different views of time uh, some might prefer the linear sense of time flow others have a more circular or spiral sense of time and so on so Within our cultural conversations on this planet, we, if we widen our, our imaginations through that, then I think we are uh, more ready to communicate with alien civilizations. Um, and uh, and you know, it's it's a matter of uh, well, <laughs> I mean, there's there's you know the Drake, the infamous or the famous Drake equation uh, gives us such a wide range of possibilities as far as the number of uh, intelligent civilizations. And it only considers a narrow range of what we call intelligence, which is having a technological civilization. You could have plenty of intelligent civilizations that aren't necessarily interested in communicating with us or that uh, haven't developed and don't care to develop that sort of technology. Hmm. So, uh, so yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot to explore there. And it inevitably involves exploring us on Earth. It's also an exploration of ourselves. So what do you think of the cosmic postcard that was sent by uh, Carl Sagan in terms of messaging extraterrestrial intelligence? Like, would that be effective uh, by today's standards? Well, well, you know, as uh, Doug Vickoch, who's the president of METI, points out, um, we if we assume that the aliens are a lot like us, like mostly visual communication and so on, then we, we, we will miss out uh, because they may be blind, for all we know. So then you'd have to figure out how to send messages differently. Um, and so I think that, and you know, earlier on, uh, people sent messages mostly through radio telescopes, uh, radio transmitting devices, but, uh, but uh, you know, if, what if they're not listening in radio or communicating in radio, you know? So we look at other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum as well. Um, and who knows, maybe, they, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if there's ever a technology that we can, uh, you know, gravitational waves are a whole other story. We know that, that they, that's one way we can listen in to these huge cosmic conversations going on. Like when I say conversations, I don't mean among aliens. I mean, uh, you know, the motions of, of planets and black holes and things like that. Uh, but uh, but maybe maybe it's some, somewhere, somehow we'll find a way to carry or listen to signals on gravitational waves. I don't know. I'm wildly <laughs> speculating here. So, yeah, I've, the, you know, it's a really interesting topic. So, the, the, you know, the Voyager um, uh, golden records, um, in some sense, the symbolism there is, is, is important because you, the chances of anybody actually finding that piece of cosmic debris in the vastness of interstellar space is tiny. You know, the... the, the in a way it was it was about a projection of an idea rather than the sense that it would actually be found at all um i've been working with a documentary maker in amsterdam called stuart Ackerholt uh in the last few years and he's been talking to people in the music community uh including philip glass and others if you were to make a new golden record today how would you do that what would you put on it philosophically because the original golden record was actually put together in incredibly short time scale there was some degree of of um uh, taking account of different cultures around the world but it was really very sort of california focused at the time and it wasn't broadly representative so we worked with various musicians on this project but we also thought if you were to really do this and you wanted to leave send a new golden record out into space perhaps a much more important thing to do would be to leave it somewhere in the solar system, um, perhaps beyond the orbit of Jupiter, because when the sun becomes a red giant, it will expand out as far as Earth. But leave it in the solar system, because that's a place that people may come in the future. It's a destination, potentially, right, rather than an empty point in space where you never find anything. And leave it as a, as a memento mori, effectively saying, we were here once, we're not anymore, we've gone. This is what we learned rather than this idea of, hey, we're here, we're ready to join you. I mean, the chances of that communication happening are, are slim. Now, going back to the METI thing, what's in, we had an interesting example a couple of years ago. We worked with an artist in 2015 who wanted to send a, a radio message out, um, essentially along the same lines. We have trouble here. 
these are our messages, don't repeat our mistakes. And it was to do with climate change and other things. Uh, and for the sake of symbolism, it was sent towards Polaris. Uh, we were using our radio, our communications dishes. We had a couple of people at that point who raised the objection, which is implicit actually in the, the books we were talking about earlier on, the Qi Jin Liu, Liu Qi Jin uh, uh, three body problem. One of the resolutions to the Fermi paradox, you know, why, if there are so many aliens out there, why aren't they talking to us? Uh, Liu Qi Jin's idea is this so-called dark forest theory that if you, what you really shouldn't do is announce that you're, you exist because there will always be somebody more powerful than you. Um, and even if most of them are benign, 1% of them are violent, they're going to come for you and stop you. And the reason that they would do that is because there's, evolution proceeds on different time scales. One day you may become a threat to them. So the dark forest theory is if you, you know, hide away, don't announce your presence. But at the same time, if you find other uh, um, alien life, which you're more powerful than, kill it immediately. Um, it's a very dystopian view of, of solution to the Fermi paradox. But because we had we had a couple of people who had read the book at that point and, and sort of said, should ESA be doing this? Should you be waking up the aliens with something like METI? We were then presented with an interesting uh, uh, dilemma when it came to uh, another possibility. We were asked by the musician Vangelis, uh, who wrote the soundtrack for Blade Runner and Chariots of Fire and, other, and so on, um, to send a message out with the words of Stephen Hawking uh, to mark Hawking's death um, a couple of years ago. And our communications people in the European Space Agency said, well, because of this concern about waking up the aliens, maybe we shouldn't do that. Um, now, it's kind of crazy because we send out signals with exactly the same dishes around the solar system all the time communicating to our spacecraft. So the very idea that one extra signal would be the thing that woke anybody up is, is stupid. Um, but we were sensitive to that. So um, we, we asked um, Stephen Hawking's daughter, Lucy, um, to kind of interpret, you know, to make sure that we didn't make a mess for the European Space Agency or for Stephen Hawking, who had spoken about this danger of waking up aliens. Um, and as a kind of acute thing, where we sent the message in the end, because we did broadcast it, we broadcast it to the nearest black hole, um, because if that's what Hawking worked on, it kind of, let's send it to the, the, the nearest black hole, with the kind of science fiction idea that the message will just go into the black hole and disappear and never be heard of again, So, uh, which isn't true either, but uh, <laughs> it goes straight past the black hole. Um, but yeah, it was it had a huge amount of resonance with people actually, not because of the meti aspect, but because the message that of Hawking's words were a profound one about actually reflecting on the planet Earth and and you know this is the only place we we know and we should not m mess it up. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we've kind of done accidental meti, but we you know, and I've met Doug a couple of times. Um, it's a very interesting topic because it raises huge amounts of questions, not only about the way what message you send out and how you interpret it, but should you be doing it at all in the first place? Um, it's an interesting, interesting. one. So uh, we have a ton of questions from the audience. Uh, let's go through some of them. Um, okay, I think. Uh, Right, so this is an interesting question. To what extent will science fiction shape ambitious future projects concerning space exploration? As in, does it help garner or generate the public enthusiasm, eventually the political will for uh, funding space exploration missions? Well, I think it, it certainly has helped ramp up the enthusiasm for it. You know, uh, the, probably the films more than the written form, but often the films are made from written science fiction. So definitely that's part of it. And unfortunately, there's plenty of, I think, terrible science fiction out there that has inspired, you know, terrible movies. Um, you know, like, like one movie I expected to love, but ended up really, really disliking was Interstellar, uh, which is exactly the... the whole colonialism in space message that we don't want. Uh, but certainly science fiction has the potential to inspire alternative visions of uh, space exploration that, that I believe. Yeah, I, I have to say, I, I, I share, I, it's perhaps not fair. I know, I know the person 
who did the uh, special effects, Paul Franklin for Interstellar. And I've never given it full credit because I've only ever seen it on an aeroplane uh, screen. So I, <laughs> I should, I'm sure it's very much more spectacular on a big screen. But it is a, I'm sorry, a shockingly bad movie uh in terms of its philosophy but also this sort of crux that there's there's lots of science and this whole business of involving kip thorn to model a, a you know a, a good looking black hole and then at some point they decide to just sort of on the back of an envelope generate a whole new bunch of relativistic calculations in about three seconds and then and then the resolution of the film is love is going to save us all it's like is this a science film or not i mean I, you know star wars you don't have that criticism right because it's not science fiction it's it is cowboys and indians in space um the other one which is sort of bad in that regard and and, and i i know it's not the you know the book is a lot better is the martian because you know again it's right. it's posited as being science fact told in a fictional way but there's so many aspects of it which are just plain wrong that it undermines itself uh same with gravity really i mean um so i but i'm very happy that arrival was mentioned because that is by far the best science fiction film of the last 10 years because it's actually it doesn't really matter all the technologies are relevant right it's it's a it's asking the fundamental questions of what it means to be human and what it means to interface with with things that aren't and your assumptions and your presumptions of course it's told in the context of a lovely story the arc of of her figuring out that time is circular and the the short story by ted chiang indeed is brilliant as as everything he writes i mean for you know it's fantastic um but um yeah, and then there's another film which just came out, and it, it, it's an interesting one about what it means to die, for example, for human beings. It's a film called Archive by Gavin Rothery, who's a British filmmaker. Uh, he worked with um, Duncan Jones on the film Moon, which is another classic science fiction of the last uh, 10, 15 years about cloning, effectively. Um, uh, but Archive just came out uh, in the UK just this last week. And I won't give anything away because it's a film you need to watch and be surprised by, so to speak. But um, there's a lot of good science fiction filmmaking out, but the blockbusters generally are not it. I mean, you've got to seek out, you know, the next the next level down. And there's so much good science fiction being written today, which could be movie stuff if it didn't just fall into the tropes of Hollywood saying, well, you know, show me the good guy and the bad guy and we'll have a fight and... But even China's doing that now as well. I mean, one of the worst science fiction films I've seen for ages, but so bad that it's worth watching because it's it's fun, is The Wandering Earth uh, by Liu Qijin, which is just utterly, well, at the risk of being rude, it's batshit crazy. It's just nuts and it's just, yeah. But, but huge, huge budget on special effects and everything else. It looks fantastic, but the story is just insane. Well, that was interesting. I mean... Uh... Getting to know the difference between uh, good and bad science fiction, like what what inspires uh, what kind of uh, an outlook towards space exploration, I think that's that's the key. Um, so yeah, one more, uh, a few more question. Uh, do sci-fi authors have to keep track of scientific accuracy, or do they use the artistic license liberally? I mean, how do you make that decision? Even to like, to what extent is it science fiction, and then? Uh, not anymore. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a great question. And actually, um, there's a whole lot of variations on the theme. So you know, if if you're playing with the uh, with science as a metaphor and you're kind of playing with it in a fantastical way, I would call that science fantasy. I mostly write science fiction. Um, sometimes I venture into you know magic realism or fantasy, but mostly science fiction. So for me personally. It's very important to uh, really know the science, um, and uh, and you know, and that's one of the reasons I love writing it because you know my area of uh, of physics, which is theoretical particle physics, uh, it allows me to go beyond that. You know, like I'm I'm not an astrophysicist, so I have to learn stuff to you know uh, know about uh, what tidally locked planets around red, red dwarf stars are like, you know, and things like that. So, so yes, uh, and, and the science, um, to a science fiction writer like myself, where uh, the aesthetic impulse is also important. It's not just the science of it. And in fact, the two are indistinguishable for me in some sense. Um, uh, for, for someone like me, the, uh, the science informs the poetic conception of the story. 
And even if I take liberties with the science, um, I want to take informed liberties with the science. You know, just as if, if somebody uh, commits a grammar error, that's different from somebody who knowingly changes the rule of grammar in order to create something artistic, right? So, so I like to be an informed, uh, you know, I've, I've written stories where I've imagined a situation where we, uh, or a universe, an alternate universe, if you will, uh, where, uh, where, you know, the universe is not uh, expanding, uh, you know, without end. And, uh, and where it crunches back, which was an older, uh, you know, there have been uh, variations on that thing. We think our universe is one where the expansion is actually, as far as we know, accelerating. So, uh, or imagining situations where the laws of physics change with time. Um, so having, having that sort of grounding in the sciences and also uh, having the respect for science to explore in regions that I'm not you know, that well versed in, um, I think that's important for the kind of science fiction I write because then it allows, uh, it's actually constraints that enable creativity to happen um, so with science as the constraint in a way, it's kind of a launch pad for creativity. Um, right. So yes, that's, that's where I stand on the issue. Yeah, for me as a reader, you know, that, that's, that's exactly what I want to read. You know, of course, there is fantasy and you can read fantasy with, you know, essentially ground rules which are independent of physics, but maybe sociological ground rules and, and, and sets. But right. for science fiction, um, Yes, I like to see people who are well aware of what the science is, but then push at it and say, well, what if, right? And uh, without without necessarily breaking it or going beyond what we might already understand. I mean, to be honest, if, if there's not enough inspiration in quantum mechanics and general relativity on their own to inspire fantastic views and, and thoughts, I mean, one science fiction writer who I, I would almost call it sort of almost crime thriller, but uses aspects of science fiction um, is Blake Crouch, um, who uh, has written several books which involve um, the, the, the classic conundrums of time travel, of going back and being able to alter the past and, and how the many, you know, the many worlds theory splinters off into various ways. I mean, again, without giving too much away, I just recommend going going read Recursion. Uh, it's an it's it's a thriller because it's a page turner, but there's a basis there which is physics, um, and it's kind of a logical consequence of the microcosmic world breaking through into the macrocosmic. You know, if it if it operates down there, what if it really is operating in in the world which is at the level of human beings? And there's no there's no reason to think it isn't. You know. The multiverse theory is a hard one to dispense with, but you know, if that if that doesn't inform a billion books, the fact that there's a universe right now where we've had this conversation, and where actually I, you know, I, I I've stood up and flown out of the window here because that's possible, right? And there's a there's a universe in which where that happens, it just doesn't happen to be the one where this call is happening. But another me at this moment actually has just flown to space and 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 arrived at the space station instantaneously through quantum tunneling or whatever. I mean, just you know, I'm making stuff up now speculating <laughs> there's an awful lot in the multiverse that you you know go for it that was an interesting conversation uh thank you professor makarian thank you professor singh uh for this fantastic panel discussion i'll hand it over to shruti thank you very much Pramit. thanks so much thank you. Well, okay. Thanks so much, Promit. That was really interesting. I honestly did not uh, realize how one hour this went by. It was very, very riveting. Uh, really managed to keep all our listeners very engaged. Promit, thank you so much for wonderfully navigating through the conversation. I think you did a great job of it. Thanks a lot. Professor McCorian and Professor Singh, such a pleasure it has been to have you at our festival. Our previous interactions have also been so lovely. Professor McCorian is back on popular demand. What can I say? He's a hit amongst the Indian audiences. Um, Professor Singh, thank you so much for your expertise that you have um, helped us out with in the past few days and it was such a, such an honor to have you both at the festival here we really do hope to host you at our festival in the coming years hoping that it's not online and it actually happens on ground and we get to see you uh, speak at our festival live thank you so much well thank you very much for inviting me back and uh i i, I think we have much to share also i i will be contacting vodana 
um, by email and uh, see if we can bring her to Space Rocks. That would be great stuff. So, but thank you very much. For oh, the that sounds wonderful. And I'm going to look for that movie, Ambition. I have to tell you that the Rosetta, uh, the Rosetta mission is one of my favorite space missions of all time. So very good. Yeah. Proving it so, doesn't. You don't always have to send humans into space, but uh, I'll send you the links for the movies because you actually have three of them, and you need to watch them in the right order. And I'll send. Oh, I'll send fantastic. You the okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shruti and Promit. This was such a pleasure. And all the best to everybody. Stay well. Thanks very Thank much. Thank you so bye much. Bye. That's the best bye part bye. about these uh, conventions. Researchers uh, get to meet each other and we get to meet them. Can't think of anything better. So thank you so much, guys. It was uh, an absolute pleasure to host you at India Science Festival. I'm just going to, um, on, the, on the last note, just going to request my audience members Oh, oops, I just went off for a second there. Uh, just going to request um, everybody to um, make sure that you all head over to our website and check out all our events that we've planned for you all in the coming few weeks. We are going to have some very exciting talks on space, robotics, healthcare, general science, as well as science communication. So make sure that you stay tuned in the last few days of India Science Festival because this fest is only on till the 31st of Jan. And, um, you know, we really want to make um, science accessible to you all. So do ensure uh, that you tune into our festival whenever you have time. Like I mentioned before, we have some very exciting uh, online games going on. So make sure you participate in those. Get your family and friends. You know, everything is free here. You don't have to pay anything. And um, can't think of a better way to spend your weekends um, at um, such a wonderful uh, festival. So make sure that you tune in and uh, do participate in our Twitter contest. We have some really exciting prizes for winners of our Twitter contest. So tell us what you like the best about our events and we'll make sure that the best tweets come to everybody's attention. And uh, you can also fill the feedback form that we have put in in the chat right now. Do, t do tell us how we can improve in the future because we really want to make this experience seamless for you all. Thank you so much for staying tuned. You all have been a wonderful audience. Thank you for your questions. And we hope to host you again um, yeah, tomorrow. We have some wonderful events lined up tomorrow and in the coming uh, a few days of last few days of January. So keep celebrating science and stay tuned with India Science Festival to hear the voice of science. Good night and see you soon.